Sì. Eh, posso pregarvi di prendere posto, vorremmo cominciare. Can I ask you to kindly take your uh, seat? I think the time has come to, in spite of the rain outside, I mean, the, I don't think we can wait anymore. I think it's better to start our, our, our works. So I would like to say, first of all, good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Buongiorno a tutti. Welcome to this conference dedicated to the Balkan region. It's an event that we keep doing every year, since 2014, when we decided that this part of Europe deserves a special attention and a better visibility. After so many repetitions, it's not easy to find the right title. And we are changing every year according to the prevailing conditions. So we used the Balkans at the crossroads and so on and so forth. We have now decided that the appropriate title is the fight for a timely inclusion. In other words, there is no doubt for us that this part of Europe should join the European and Euro-Atlantic institutions. In our eyes, this is a natural destiny. It seems to us that the main issue is about timing. It means that for the people concerned, the point of arrival should be visible and concrete to avoid frustration and disillusion. The Balkans are important for, to us, to the, to the Foundation, for another good reason. Because this is a region, and I would like to underline that and have your attention on this. This is a region where NATO and the European Union have worked for years in close cooperation for the benefit of all. Just a couple of examples. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have at present the European Operation Altea following the NATO's previous operation. And in Kosovo, common work is a concrete daily reality as elsewhere in the region. What does it mean? It is a proof that practical cooperation between two organizations having a similar membership, including the most significant democracies in the world, can be of real benefit and a multiplier. And this precedent should be used in other parts of the world and it will be welcomed by the citizens. I am happy of your presence here today. And of course, you understand easily that to keep the conference in this format has not been an easy decision. The alternative being just a discussion by a webinar. But we thought that it would be good news and practice to go back to normality with the right safety guarantees as we are doing today, following the actual rules. We all wish to put this terrible period behind us, and the physical event is also an act of hope. In spirit of the difficult environment, we have been, in spite of the difficult environment, we have been able to put together an impressive group of personalities coming from different destinations. We have the best sources of knowledge and expertise on the Balkans, and I thank all of you for having accepted our invitation. The philosophy, or in better words, the, the methodology that we use at the foundation remains the same. Our aim is to provide for the general public, and not only to the specialists, a good frame for discussing strategic issues relevant in today's world. You all have the booklet with the program and the relevant information. We have a daring program. The introductory remarks are made by the Santis, Nicola de Santis, from the NATO Public Diplomacy Division in Brussels. The first panel will debate the complex situation concerning the problems of accession, including a presentation by the European Commission, which is a novelty. Afterwards, we will be in touch with the other side of the Atlantic, an interview with the Vice President of the Atlantic Council, Damon Wilson, and it will be promoted by our good friends, Spanaus, who is here from Milan. The second panel will address societal and economic issues of the region, things that have to proceed in parallel with the institutional problem process of accession. The Honorable Piero Fassino, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Chamber of Deputies, and a real 
a real expert, a real person attached to the Balkans. I know him since many years. I'm very happy that he has accepted the invitation. He is here and will deliver the concluding remarks. I wish to thank also all those who have supported us for the event. PMI International, the NATO Public Diplomacy Division, the Balkan Trust for Democracy, the European Commission, and of course, the staff of the Foundation for their very difficult work. I thank you all for your presence and for your attention. Buon pomeriggio a tutti e buon lavoro. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephen Mariano. I'm the dean at the NATO Defense College, and I'd just like to uh, also add my welcome and thanks uh, to Ambassador Minuto Rizzo, uh, and congratulations to the foundation for organizing this event. Uh, the college partners with the foundation in lots of ways. Um, recently, we at the college, we uh, embarked on a program where we have each uh, course member in a committee write a study project. And we've partnered with the foundation on, on those study projects, for example, uh, by providing uh, mentorship to the committee or allowing them, the course members to provide presentations. But we've also partnered with the foundation on, on running conferences like this one. And we tried something unique uh, this last year where we organized a seminar on space strategies uh, with the foundation. And we also tried to organize this uh, session uh, on the Western Balkans in April, right in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis, and it didn't quite work out. But we were able at the college to keep uh, the senior course going through the height of the crisis, and we learned a lot of lessons. And one of those lessons is that we can do it. And we did it, and we can do it. And we can do these types of events uh, where we can protect uh, each other from the virus and we can get to this interaction, this interpersonal interaction that we know is much better than what we experience on the screen. Um, the screen isn't bad, it's not evil. Uh, virtual education isn't evil, uh, but we agree, uh, I think we all agree that there's other dimensions to learning that happen when you're there in person. And I'm standing here today on behalf of uh, the new commandant at the NATO Defense College, uh, Lieutenant General Olivier Rittemann who would have been a perfect fit for this based on his previous role as the Vice Chief of Staff at SHAPE, where he was also the commander of uh, the EU forces uh, in the Balkans. So it would have been a really lovely uh, fit. But unfortunately, he couldn't make it today. Um, but we are very impressed with the effort that, um, that the foundation has put into organizing this event. It's impressive uh, lineup of speakers. I'm excited to, to be up here uh, as part of part of this, and I look forward to hearing uh, those, uh, their comments and their insights. You know, the college was really determined in graduating that class uh, over the summer, and we brought everybody back uh, for our courses in the fall. We plan to run all of our courses uh, at the college in the fall in this type of way. It's a little uncomfortable, but so far, so good. And I would say the faculty, uh, staff, and course members are determined to make it work. And I think what I expect here today is some of that same determination to make the conference work, so complimenti. And uh, I think that that same determination will probably be found in our speakers uh, for this topic of inclusion uh, in the Balkans where all the voices can be heard and we can make progress for peace and security. So with that, uh, let me say also congratulations and welcome and that the college is uh, happy to be part of this event. Thank you very much.
Ministerio Primero. Do we need to wear the mask while we're not talking? Uh, no, I think, I think we, we, we are safe. Do we have the right distance? Yes. <laughs> Probably. Okay. We keep the distance. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, in this uh, hybrid world uh, that we live in, uh, we can expect changes of uh, schedule uh, as the one that we are just uh, witnessing and, and doing. Um, a very warm welcome to you also from my side. My name is Ivan Vevada. I'm a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna otherwise from Belgrade, Serbia. And uh, I'd like to thank Ambassador Minuto Rizzo, the NATO Defense College Foundation, for pursuing uh, this initiative, which is extremely important in a world uh, in which we're challenged by so many other things. And yet, I think those of us who are in this room and the speakers on this panel uh, believe deeply in the need to pursue the enlargement to the Western Balkans uh, in the Euro-Atlantic community, NATO, and the European Union, and in particular uh, because uh, we are seeking to see in American parlance a Europe whole, free, uh, and at peace. Uh, and thus it is very heartening that even in these difficult times we are here, and it's really impressive to see uh, such a numerous audience uh, because many of us have not traveled for a long time and have not been in real events but have been zooming, zooming, zooming uh, for the past uh, several, uh, if not many more, uh, months. Um, I'm very honored uh, to be chairing uh, this panel where we have one uh, virtual um, uh, participant, uh, Maciej Popovsky, again a friend, uh, and participant in these meetings who is the acting director uh, in uh, Brussels for the neighborhood and enlargement negotiations. And of course you have more detailed biographies in the program so I won't uh, go into any detail. Uh, to my far left is Valerie Hopkins, the Financial Times Southeast uh, Europe correspondent and I'm sure many of you have been reading uh, her articles. Uh, then uh, Ambassador uh, Andrea Orizio, uh, I'm following the, the program here, who is uh, for another two days, I think, the head of the mission of OSC, uh, mission to Serbia, and uh, will be taking up a post at the Farnesina uh, after that. Uh, to my left, uh, friend and colleague, uh, Professor Ahmed Evin, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Sabanci University in Istanbul. And last but not least, uh, Lars Geiser, visiting lecturer at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna. So we're in the same city, yeah, the same city. at the moment, <laughs> uh, which is wonderful. Uh, may I ask the organizers if we do have Maciej Popovsky? Yes, uh, he's joining soon, so we will start. With someone else. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I, I will start with you, Ambassador, then. Uh, uh, as, as we wait for, uh, for uh, Maciej Popovsky uh, to, to join us. The, th uh, the theme of our panel, as you see, uh, is ways and means for a credible inclusion. Now, I won't uh, exercise with you uh, the whole discussion about enlargement fatigue on the one hand uh, in the European member states and uh, what some of our friends in the region have called patience fatigue uh, in the Western Balkans, or uh, if I may add the fact that the countries where I and others come from have not been doing, in my personal view, enough to pursue the agenda of democratic reforms, and in particular on issues of rule of law, uh, corruption, and, and uh, such the like. Uh, what uh, for the experts uh, is, are the chapters 23 and 24 of the EU enlargement processes. There's been a change in the rules of the game. Uh, there has been, of course, uh, a return of the issue that the European Union needs to deepen before it widens that President Macron brought forward. There was a very unexpected delay in giving North Macedonia and Albania an invitation 
uh, to move forward. That was, uh, we had to wait close to a year. In June, uh, that happened. There was a green light for these co two countries, which was welcomed by all of us uh, in, in the region, because again, the region moves forward uh, as a formation, and I think that's uh, the important way that these countries will be integrated, no matter that each country, of course, um, moves on its own merits uh, in, in these issues and in the turbulent world that we are. And then, last but not least, uh, just to mention, and we will address this issue, what is euphemistically called the uh, role of third actors in the region. Less euphemistically, we're talking about Russia, China, Turkey, the Emirates, and uh, in the Middle East. Having said that, uh, the floor is to someone who has spent now time in the region and who has followed all of this very closely. So, Ambassador, please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure to be here, to see many old friends and, uh, and people who gave me a lot of guidance also on this area, especially um, here. And, uh, and really, my congratulations to the NATO, um, to NATO Defense College Foundation for being brave enough to organize this hybrid uh, event, which all the, 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 the possible things which are unexpected, which, um, which happen, it's part of, the, of our reality every day here. Uh, certainly, the OSC perspective is a specific one, but also a, a wider somehow one, because uh, certainly you will all touch on, the, uh, on how changing geopolitics impact the developments in the Balkans and, uh, and its wider integration. And of course, against this backdrop, the OSC provides a platform for inclusive dialogue, uh, even at times when the return of geopolitics may pull in the opposite direction, multilateral diplomacy faces a progressive disengagement uh, on the part of influential global players. 2020 will not be re remembered for that, but it is the 45th anniversary of the Helsinki Final Act and the 30th anniversary of the Charter of Paris for a New Europe. And this is still somehow the basis, and that's why I wanted to mention it, of a, of a peculiar organization, which is an organization which is not really an organization, which started as a conference, which became a kind of permanent conference, still has this nature, but also this flexibility. What, um, uh, what really uh, somehow is the fundamental is, first of all, to go back to, to the spirit of OSCE, to build trust in difficult time. To, to have a dialogue to build peace and stability when this is not easy. And somehow this was the, the initial dynamic of the organization which started, uh, which started from with that spirit. And of course that is always stay, staying there. Mm, multilateralism as an element of the global security architecture is a uh, what still is the engine of the organization, which also, of course, faces difficult times. And also the fact that uh, uh, there are, of course, values which are uh, the root of it and the reason for a dialogue is not enough. Without field operations, this would be one of the many uh, fora. Field operations, as we are called, uh, are the added value which shows on the ground watch what sometimes the softest of soft powers, as I call it, can do. It's the softest of soft powers, but the one which is left deeper than anybody else into the essence of a state, of a rule of law state, also for, for some reasons which are in a capability, in know-how, but also in the attitude. Um, under my, my leadership, I made it very clear since the beginning that uh, two pillars of cooperation are partnership with all stakeholders, but even more uh, with that, the ownership by the state. It's up to Serbia in this case, which is hosting me and my 150 almost uh, teammates uh, to decide what it wants to be, what it has to be, where it wants to stay. It's up to the mission to give real assistance. Sometimes I detest when the organization is seen as just delivering conferences. Sometimes conferences are essential, as we see today, because it is essential to really speak, to exchange. 
but we can be also very, very concrete. There are things which in Serbia, I'm very proud of that, exist just because we exist and we were doing together with, uh, with local authorities, civil society, independent bodies, parliament, institutions, government, of course. There are just, uh, um, it's a, so it's a very tailored assistance. Somehow the mission to Serbia is considered one of the two ends of what the OSC is able to do on the ground. One end is Ukraine, very similar to a peacekeeping operation under different uh, packaging. And the other end is uh, uh, the OSC mission to Serbia, to a country which is a very important participating state, which was chairing the organization itself five years ago. Uh, the chairmanship in office has this difficult task of starting from values to adapt to, to evolving needs. And that's exactly in line with what um, we are doing on the ground. Now this year it's Albania having this um, pleasure in a particularly complex time. But giving attention to the region, this I think was also important. There are just for you, for those of you who are not familiar with that, four areas which are, which are, which are essential, main elements of a modern democracy on its integration path, wherever it wants to go. System based on rule of law, with clear separation of powers and an independent judiciary, rule of law, and I was not surprised you mentioned this as one of the challenges, but also accountable security forces under effective democratic oversight. This is the security cooperation in stricter sense. Also functioning representative and inclusive democratic institutions for all citizens, including national minorities, and this is the so-called democratization part of our job, and certainly, uh, last but not least, the free and professional media performing its watchdog role in a clear legislative framework on the basis of high critical standards. And the whole media sector is there. That's why we are divided in this. Certainly, we feel we have been since the beginning, we are, we have been there since 2001, a trusted partner and a honest broker um, and uh, that our assistance is sought. There is more and more request for our assistance, not less. And of course, the regional dimension is essential. I think there is no activity we do, we conduct, which does not have a regional dimension. This, of course, think of a, a global threats or um, uh, fight against uh, trafficking of migrants or organized crime. Of course, without the regional dimension, this would be simply nothing, I have to say. Um, of course, uh, the starting point is that uh, uh, the, the activities uh, and then to, to enforce, to have a stronger security cannot be done, and this is the challenge, especially I think this year under the scrutiny of everybody, without uh, respect for human rights and functioning democratic institutions. So I will give some few examples, and then of course I'm open to, to Q&A and dialogue. For instance, I would like to mention, first of all, our engagement in media freedom and the safety of journalists, because I think that this year some special attention has to be devoted to this, and I'm not thinking of Serbia alone, but of the whole OSC wider family. Um, upon request of the top authorities, the mission supported the development of a new media strategy, which is a tool, only a tool, but a key tool toward a healthier media environment based on media freedom, ethics, professionalism, and literacy, which is also essential. Um, citizens uh, have to have the means to understand also the flow of information. Um, and our support enabled certainly transparent and participatory discussion, which was not existing before, because we had this, we, we call the convening power of OSC, which is, again, a very soft power, but everybody was sitting around the same table, something you can take for granted, but which was not to be taken for granted at that time with the polarization which was characterizing the media environment and relationship between media and authorities at that time. And that really uh, somehow worked very well. Now we are at the most important stage, which is the implementation. Now we have a very good strategy. The implementation is the real challenge. We will be there for sure. But also, transnational uh, threats are, of course, uh, crucial, and we apply the cross-dimensional approach to our activities supporting the fight against organized crime, 
by uh, tackling in a holistic way its drivers and manifestations by strengthening law enforcement capacities and by promoting sustainable cross-border cooperation. For instance, we foster the establishment of and continue supporting of the permanent conference of organized crime prosecutors who finally exchange data which are essential thanks to that things are happening, arrests are taken, seizures are happening and this is taking together 12 EU and non-EU countries. But also we have uh, helped the creation and the operational capability of the task force for combating smuggling of human beings and facilitated its operational meetings with other counterparts from the region and, and this resulted in an increased number of charges against members of organized crime groups. Again, regional dimension, being concrete, donating things. We donated some four-wheel drive cars which were needed on that day, not six months later, as other donors would have done. We have the flexibility, at least, and the tailoring of uh, our assistances. But, of course, uh, let's uh, think of um, also sector of intervention that well illustrates our multifaceted approach in the fight against corruption, which you very rightly mentioned as one of the most important fields of cooperation, we have supported Serbia on the prevention and repression fronts, which brought about a remarkable increase in the country's capacity in anti-money laundering and countering financing of terrorism. And also, we facilitated Serbia's cooperation with the OSC office, the ODIR, the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, for, to improve, in order to improve the electoral conditions. This is also a very important task. And uh, now we're still waiting for the um, final report of the elections which took place uh, on the 21st of June. But uh, we are, of course, uh, we will continue to assist the um, uh, ODIR and other institutions in uh, in having a process. It's not something which you can do only six months before elections and forget about it. And I have to say, I met Minister Stefanovic, Minister of Interior, Deputy Prime Minister, who is in charge also of the coordination of this. And it was him telling me this is a process and we are ready to continue. There is now a new government which has to be formed. But this, of course, uh, will be a, another test, let's say, of the uh, type of cooperation. Yes, I will come to the conclusion, but not without uh, mentioning the parliamentary uh, dimension, which is absolutely essential, and which, uh, which is uh, mm, a, a maybe less strong point here. Now there is a new parliament, which has still to, to start fully its uh, function to nominate a speaker and the secretary general, and that, of course, will be essential to see, because diversity is essential, and certainly last elections were raising some concern there. Just let me mention that youth mainstreaming is one way we somehow strengthen, but also gender mainstreaming. And this is something in which in both areas we I think we're advancing. I don't like to put these two things together, like there are two dimensions put together, but it's important to see how we tailor the assistance to, to what to do and how to, we try to empower uh, youth. Uh, let me only say that during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we adapted our assistance. We were very concrete on the one hand. We gave some emergency aid to people who were in need, who were not reachable by others. But also we helped, for instance, uh, police officers who are uh, fighting against uh, trafficking human beings to have ICT licenses. So we always work on different layers. So certainly a lot to do, a lot has been done. The attitude and the open door is essential if we want to be effective. At the same time, very proud to say that we had also in the latest meeting with the Permanent Council in Vienna, the support by all participating states, which is not a very usual um, case, but which shows, I think, that we are on the right path with a lot, a lot of work to do, and which I will leave to my successor. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Extremely important to stress the need to strengthen all of the in institutions that you mentioned because they are the checks and balances on any possibility to go out of the mainstream of a democratic system, but I'm sure we'll come to that. I see Maciej Popowski uh, in our uh, real virtual uh, TV screen here in front of us, uh, so I'll ask Maciej to, to take the floor. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Even uh, apologies, we had some some um, technical hiccups uh, connecting, and I'm I'm really sorry that it's all chaotic because I will have to leave shortly thereafter. It's one of these days when everything happens at the same time. But um, glad to be able to join. I mean, uh, I would have loved to come myself. I was there last year with you and some other uh, familiar faces. It's always a pleasure. Um, but, um, you know, it's, a, it's quite a, um, th this year is really uh, another Balkans year for, for us, for the, for the European Union. It remains a top priority for, for, for the EU, and uh, it was stressed by, by President Ursula von der Leyen in her recent State of the Union address. She devoted uh, quite some attention to the, to the Balkans basically saying that uh, we share the same history and it's in our strategic interest to bring them closer. Um, and, and with this in mind, uh, we started to reinvigorate the enlargement process. Well, it started already in, in, in the first weeks of uh, 2020 with the new enlargement methodology that we uh, put forward, uh, proposed by Commissioner Barheli, uh, which helped us to overcome the, the deadlock in the Council concerning the uh, the opening of accession uh, negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia. Now we are there. I mean, no date yet, but uh, but we are moving there, and this is really important. This methodology, um, its main aim is to make enlargement more credible, predictable, and dynamic, but also to give uh, to the member states a stronger political steering. Um, in short, uh, the methodology will bring about a strong focus on fundamental reforms, starting with the rule of law, functioning of democratic institutions and public administration, as well as economies uh, of the candidate uh, countries. The whole process remains merit-based, so this is not going to change. Um, and the future work, the accession process, uh, will um, be streamlined, will be organized in six thematic clusters. First, fundamentals, second, internal market, third, competitiveness and inclusive growth, fourth, the green agenda and sustainable connectivity, and fifth, resources, agriculture and cohesion, uh, and six, I'm sorry, six clusters, and the sixth uh, is internal um, uh, relations, external relations. Um, so we will open negotiations uh, on each cluster as a whole, I'm not going chapter by chapter, uh, which is a novel. Um, we will also provide more clarity to, to the candidate themselves on things that are going to uh, concern them. Building on this, um, uh, we are now going to present our annual enlargement package. This is due to be uh, adopted next week. Uh, and that will provide a detailed overview of, of the state of play of fundamental uh, uh, reforms and, and the accession process. This is a, an annual, ex annual exercise. Nevertheless, we take it very seriously. And it's based on objective uh, criteria. Uh, we use a lot of reporting. We reach out to a lot of friends and partners, including some of the organizations present either on stage or, uh, or online. Um, of course, um, the, the, this year's report will be, as everything else in the world, uh, affected by the COVID pandemic because it, it brought unprecedented challenges for, for um, uh, individuals, societies, uh, government structures in, in the region. Um, and we stood, stood by the Western Balkan countries uh, right from the, from the onset of, of the crisis and provided them with a, with a huge support package worth some 3.3 billion euros to help the region overcome uh, the consequences of, uh, of COVID. Uh, we used a, a mix of different tools, um, grants, uh, soft loans that we call macroeconomic, uh, macro financial uh, assistance, uh, and then uh, also a, a 1.7 billion package um, of um, assistance by the European Investment Bank. Still, the consequences for the region will be, will be severe. Um, so that's why we now focus on supporting the long-term social economic recovery uh, of the Western Balkans um, and its convergence with the, with the EU. And in order to get there, um, the Commission will, will adopt uh, soon, next week, uh, it will be a second uh, communication that will be adopted by the College so the Commission will adopt an economic and investment plan for the for the region, 
It will include a substantial investment package. Um, uh, it will also increase financial guarantees to support private sector. It will focus on connectivity, digitalization, green agenda. So it will make a link with the big priorities of the underlying commission of the EU and the EU as a whole uh, between the, those priorities and, and, and the regions. A uh, few words on, on security, which is on everybody's mind uh, uh, over there um, in, in Rome. Um, this remains a, a priority. We have the, the whole enlargement process has a clear security dimension with strong focus on the better law enforcement and, and, and fighting uh, organized crime, terrorism, uh, on money laundering, also on dealing with, uh, with uh, uh, irregular uh, migration. Um, so have uh, some new tools at our disposal, at our disposal hopefully, um, because the Commission has put forward the, the blueprint of a new pact on migration and asylum, and uh, that would uh, strengthen our hand in also in, in dealing with partner countries, countries of, of transit in, uh, uh, in particular. Of course, COVID brought new uh, security challenges or exacerbated the existing uh, uh, ones. In particular, uh, it exposed some vulnerabilities in, in our societies uh, and infrastructure. So vulnerabilities to cyber attacks, to fake news, to, to all kinds of high threats. Um, you know, the Western Balkans was, uh, the whole region was really exposed to, uh, to disinformation and misinformation campaigns by all kinds of actors. Um, and, and therefore, we, uh, we are also going to, to step up our cooperation um, with regard to, to media, media literacy, um, and the media landscape in, uh, in general. And this is uh, an area, I mean, the whole, the whole domain of hybrid threats is an area were, were really work hand in hand with, uh, with NATO and the, the cooperation between the EU and NATO uh, in the region has been exemplary. I'm not going to go into uh, uh, much details, but, um, but uh, I think we are looking out. I mean, I'm not only talking about uh, us working in parallel in, in places like, like Bosnia and Kosovo with presence on, on, on the ground, but also uh, looking at specific issues like uh, like uh, trans transparency, good governance, accountability of the defense sectors, so or capacity capacity building. So you know we uh, are different organizations and, and we have different tools and, and we are following different procedures. But we are certainly united by a common purpose of of building lasting stability, security, and prosperity in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maciej. And indeed, it was good of you to uh, recall our meeting here last year uh, and to uh, thereby testify to the uh, continuity uh, of this effort here. And thank you also for reminding us of the, the, the new way that the enlargement has been envisaged uh, and that is going forward. And I think, obviously, to the interest of the citizens themselves of all these six countries who do want a society and a state based on the rule of law where, in fact, the government and the state are servants of the citizens and not the other way around. Uh, thank you. So we, we move uh, forward. Uh, Professor Ahmed Evin, as I mentioned, is, is from, from Turkey. Obviously, Turkey has uh, uh, been stopped uh, in its way forward <laughs> to the EU somewhat, uh, but that is not our theme today. So, uh, Ahmed, I'd like to ask you to, to give your thoughts on, on this theme that, that we have been proposed here. And Thank you. It's hopefully it's... keeping to the time limits. <laughs> I, I, I hope so. Uh, but uh, thank you, and, and um, uh, my thanks also to um, Ambassador Minuto Rizzo and uh, colleagues and friends at the, um, uh, the Defense College Foundation. It's uh, great to be back in Rome. Um, the, and at an earlier uh, uh, co uh, conference uh, here in Rome, I suggested the predominance of uh, centrifugal forces that detract from cooperation among states in the region, and hence from the very coherence of the region. Um, now, there has been uh, progress, of course, in the direction that uh, 
you mentioned uh, since uh, and now there are four Western Balkan countries that are at the EU membership negotiating stage and three of the uh, Balkan countries that are members of NATO. But convergence is still somewhat lacking. Um, one recent example last week um, was uh, the uh, intervention by Bulgaria trying to stop the opening of the uh, accession talks um, of North Macedonia, claiming that uh, North Macedonia is not admitting of a common history and culture with Bulgaria. Now, as um, I was pondering about my assignment for this uh, session, uh, it is strategic links between the Balkans, Russia, and Mediterranean, I remembered a, a vivid and masterfully depicted explanation um, by Ivan Krastev of Central Europe as opposed to Western Europe. Uh, while in Western Europe, and I'm quoting Ivan Krastev, while uh, Western Europe, uh, in Western Europe, it was the legacy of the colonial empires that shaped encounters with the non-European world. Central European states were born of the disintegration of Europe's continental empires. The 19th century ethnic mosaic of Western Europe was generally harmonious, like a Kaspar David Friedrich landscape, whereas that of Central Europe resembled more the, uh, an expressionist canvas by Oskar Kokoschka. Um, that's, a, that's really a masterful uh, description, but I think it also applies some, uh, somehow uh, in a very vivid fashion to um, uh, the Balkans. Uh, in fact, the uh, Balkans uh, and its uh, current shape is the result of the collapse of two uh, empires. Now, uh, the strategic links of the region with others follows the same pattern of affinity, particularly confessional affinity, by which I mean the various countries of the Balkans have particular links that also um, uh, reinforce this um, uh, centrifugal tendency that is uh, already existing there. Uh, the special relationship of uh, Serbia with Russia is one uh, outstanding example of this. Uh, more recently, NATO bombing of Belgrade during the Kosovo War brought Belgrade and Moscow closer. Although Serbia is now cooperating with NATO, it still does not feel sanguine about membership uh, in NATO. Now, Turkey's AKP government, in parallel, has been keen to cultivate its own strategic links in the Balkans as an important part of its strategy to confirm and project its status as a regional power. Ankara's neo-Ottomanist approach to its broader neighborhood including certainly the Balkans, uh, has meant that Turkey places priority on building relationships with the Muslim population, supporting religious instruction in parts of the Balkans and providing funds for the restoration, for example, almost exclusively of Ottoman mosques and religious buildings in, in Bosnia. So there's another example that reinforces um, the centrifugal uh, situation uh, that obtains, uh, continues to obtain. In the wake of the Bosnian War, this is the more radical, uh, several Muslim countries and Muslim organizations also supported programs and projects to propagate conservative and even radical forms of Islam, particularly in Bosnia, but other parts of the Balkans as well. Moreover, around 2,000 Salafis came to Bosnia to join the fighting. 
They saw the war as an opportunity for conducting jihad and establishing a foothold for radical Islam in the region. A far more important strategic link is now being forged between the Balkans and the Mediterranean by China's Belt and Road Initiative. China's purchase and development of the port of Piraeus has resulted in, West, in the West Balkans becoming an arterial link in the economic space between the Eastern Mediterranean and Central Europe. This might be viewed as a unique opportunity by many of the Balkan countries to be on the main artery to a market of half a billion prosperous consumers, and at the same time having a chance to build their own infrastructure on, par, uh, on a par with that of the market in question. Would the Belt and Road Initiative be a catalyst to prepare the Balkans for a credible inclusion in the European club? There are serious doubts about that question, obviously. For one, the Belt and Road Initiative is seen as a project that carries the danger of burdening smaller countries with large debts that they would not be able to pay. The often quoted example from the region is the famous highway in Montenegro. This, the loan for this project from China um, has pushed the GDP to debt ratio up to uh, 80%. Above, yeah. Yeah, about 80%. The, the large financing facilities that China extends in association with the Belt and Road Initiative is also seen as an inducement for increasing corruption, particularly among autocratic governments anywhere in the world, not necessarily in, in, in the Balkans alone, or even among governments where a culture of transparency has not taken root. Needless to say, a great many countries fall into that category. We have examples um, and cases from Southeast Asia more recently. From the EU side, moreover, Beijing's 17 plus one initiative to promote Belt and Road Initiative in Central and Eastern Europe is, in itself, a divisive move driving a wedge right in the middle of the EU itself. It is difficult to ignore the continued play of centrifugal forces in the Balkans, both from within and outside the region. Nevertheless, let me hasten to add that although there is good reason to be concerned, there is also a reason not to be overwhelmed by pessimism. The Balkans are no longer unique in displaying the lack of regional coherence or convergence of interests. That happens elsewhere, <laughs> including membership of the, of the NATO. At the moment, we are witnessing a global transition away from the certainties of old order. But we do not know what kind of an order or at least what kind of an international arrangement the world might be able to establish in future, even whether it will be capable of establishing any kind of coherent system at all in the foreseeable future. The Balkans, their part, will be able to achieve convergence and coherence if and only if the peoples and governments of the region will be able to identify their collective interests in the same way as Western European leaders did in the aftermath of the Second World War. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've, you've raised a, a number of very important questions, and I'm sure that in the discussion we'll, we'll come back to, to a number of them. And in the interest of time, I'll uh, move uh, straight on to, to Valerie Hopkins, uh, who I think will look at some of these similar issues. Thanks very much, Ivan, and thank you very much to the organizers for bringing me here to my first uh, conference in person in the, in the COVID period. It's nice to see so many friends behind the mascarinas and um, <laughs> looking forward to, to a good discussion. Um, 
I will try, I'm just, I arrived here uh, from Serbia um, after a week uh, doing some reporting and research about the role of China in Serbia and kind of increasing um, positioning in between the US-China trade war. So I'm thinking to focus a bit on that, maybe a sneak preview of the story you might see in the paper next week. Um, but I should say that I'm speaking in my personal capacity and not uh, representing my paper um, necessarily here. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting to see, um, to view the Serbian relationship with China now in relation to, to the deal that, that we've just seen uh, struck and signed in Washington. Um, the Center for Strategic and International Studies has a, has a great report out. I'm sure many of you have already seen it. Um, but those of you who haven't, it really looks at um, the steel friendship between Serbia and China, um, especially in the wake of COVID, um, and it goes as far as to call Serbia now a client state of China, um, which is fairly uh, concerning title for, for a prospective EU member. Um, and it, in, the, in the report, I don't represent CSIS, of course, but in the report it makes quite a number of, of very interesting and I think compelling recommendations about how much more strongly the EU needs to, to present itself and its work in Serbia. But I think we, we should um, acknowledge that uh, now in uh, March 2020, 40% of Serbians believe that China was the biggest donor to Serbia and fewer than 20% thought that it was the EU. Um, and also this is a trend that we see kind of increasing because uh, in the whole region, 14 out of the 18 new technology projects um, in, the, in the Western Balkans regions of, of that China invested were in Serbia, and 40% of those were signed since 2019. So it seems, it looks as if there is a massive increase. Whether this um, agreement that was signed in Washington or letter of intent, maybe we should call it, uh, will we'll reverse that and change that, I think, really remains to be seen. And it's going to be quite interesting to see um, the influence of the coming election in, in, in the United States uh, regarding that, and also the degree to which um, yeah, the degree to which Serbia uses it as a pretext to maybe decouple a little bit um, from China. I think, you know, we you mentioned and we've all mentioned uh, this idea of convergence. And I think that uh, it's going to be quite interesting to, to, to watch. Of course, at this point, you know, Serbia has the strongest possible relationship with NATO that it can have. Um, but as it continues to buy more and more weapons and technology uh, from China, it's, you, I, it, you wonder at what point does that uh, become challenged, right? So hopefully we can have a more robust, I'm trying, I'm just trying to put some points for discussion that we can maybe discuss. But, you know, it's quite interesting because it does, uh, of course, seem that uh, it is in the Chinese interest for Serbia to join the EU and to maintain very close ties to the West. But sometimes it seems that the Chinese are burning the bridge uh, as they're building it, to the, the burning the Serbian bridge to the EU as they're building it. I also think it's very important to talk about the, the political implications of this. I mean, I, somehow it didn't really make very big news. Um, but you had in February this year, uh, Marko Đurić, the officer, chief officer for, for Kosovo in the Serbian government and future ambassador to Washington, um, you know, speaking in a video about a trip that he made to Xinjiang and how um, he believed that uh, the standards uh, under which people were being held in Xinjiang in, in what most of my colleagues journalists call concentration camps um, were, were very good minority protections and that, that uh, the standard of minority protection in China should be the envy uh, of, his, of his country and, and many other countries. And I think, you know, these kind of soft things are also um, a little bit alarming from a very powerful official in the ruling party in Serbia. Um, and I don't know, I mean, maybe it would be interesting to ask Ambassador Orizio how much pushback there, there was for, for such statements, because I haven't seen another Western official uh, say something like that. And of course, the EU is a community of values and, and uh, to a certain degree, so is NATO, right? Um, so um, what else do I wanna say? I think it's quite interesting, I'm, I'm supposed to talk about external actors, so I think it's also quite interesting to observe the, the evolving role of the US um, 
uh, in the region, uh, also in Serbia, I think that this deal, there's been so much that has been said about uh, these letters that were signed in the Oval Office, and I think, again, we still have to, it remains to be seen how we will, how much of them will be implemented, uh, but I think it, it, it is, um, it does show an increased uh, and important uh, interest of the U.S. Uh, re interest in the region, um, and and if there is some collaboration and cooperation, that could be quite powerful. I was uh, in Belgrade on Tuesday as. Um, White House envoy Grinnell said that you know it was under American um, pressure that that Serbs agreed to start using the border, the new border crossing built by the EU um, on the border between Kosovo and Serbia. And if that's the case, I mean, I think that there can there have been some quite positive uh, developments from this. You also see it in in soft power, like this weekend's um, Operation Halyard, a celebration of. Um, the way that uh, Serbian forces helped American and British troops uh, escape, I think, in 1944. Um, and I think that shows this was the first time that was ever commemorated. There's now a statue being built, and it shows that also the U.S. is, is, is fighting a bit for more influence and to improve relations. And, and on the Serbian side, uh, from all of the, Ser the government officials that I talked to, they were incredibly excited about sort of this new reopening to Washington. They said that they haven't experienced relations like this with Washington for 140 years in terms of the high level visit that you saw, et cetera. Um, however, I think we also need to watch out for, for, for the promises uh, that were made in terms of financing some of these deals. You spoke about the Belt and Road, uh, but uh, you know, the DFC, the Development Finance Corporation that, that came to Serbia, um, would probably not fund something like the Montenegro Highway. So, so you know, issues of, of corruption still remain and, and, and financing still remain in terms of these, these spheres of influence. Um, maybe I'm going a bit too fast, but, um, but it, it seemed to me as well that there is uh, also this intentional flow pull back from Russia. I don't know if you perceive that as well, Ivan, but in the public communications that I saw in Serbia, in, in the public polling about how people perceive Russia, of course you still see like Putin t-shirts everywhere, but, but from, from the way that officials are, are communicating with Russia and about Russia, I, I find that quite interesting. Um, another way that the U.S. is involved, I, well, Croatia is now in the EU, of course, but you, we see Pom um, Secretary of State Pompeo coming this week. Uh, to uh, urge the Croatians not to give a concession for their port in Rijeka uh, for 50 years to the Chinese. And I, I, it's interest, for me, it's quite interesting. I'm sure that there's a lot going on behind the scenes uh, among EU ambassadors, but I'm quite curious to, to see whether and how uh, Secretary Pompeo will be successful. Um, you already spoke about the highway in Montenegro. Um, I, I wanted to also address, Mr. Pawlowski mentioned some of the, the region's security challenges, and, and you too even, of organized crime and corruption, disinformation, um, and also cyber attacks. Um, we saw even in North Macedonia during the elections this year, there was a massive cyber attack to the, to the electoral system. Um, and I think these kinds of things are, are quite alarming and uh, hopefully, uh, will be happening <laughs> less in the future and not more. Um, but I think it's also important to acknowledge that that all of that uh, that these countries have done a very good job of um, helping to manage with irregular migration. Um, of course, there's a lot of problems, and of course, uh, some of the pictures that you see, especially from Bosnia, are quite alarming. But but I think that the there's been a lot of cooperation, and especially also in terms of returning foreign fighters. I think that that's something that should be, you know, okay, it's. The fact that we haven't had any any big incidents um, also shows that that there's a lot of co cooperation and a lot of things going on. Um, and also, I, I, I think your, to your point about the the Turks um, and the, or the religious affinities, I I think it's um, it's quite interesting to observe also that that actually I find the relationship between Turkey and Serbia to be very strong. When Erdogan made a big trip to the region, he stayed four days in, in Serbia, uh, much longer than he stayed anywhere else. And, and on, on Friday, you saw Vucic go to Istanbul to, to speak about the, the negotiations in Washington and to, I don't know, make, try to make amends perhaps for, for, for what uh, 
Mr. Erdogan saw as a, an inappropriate uh, commitment to move the embassy to Jerusalem. And, and I didn't see this Kosovo being asked to do the same thing or, or having, have, you know, I, we have the ambassador here, so maybe she can address that. But uh, um, I do think that there is also uh, quite, uh, quite a strong tie um, between Serbia and, and Turkey. And um, I mean, maybe I'm just sort of zooming through my points, but, but maybe it'll be better to just have open up the discussion a bit. Thanks. Good. Thank you, Valerie. <laughs> you, you gave us uh, additional granularity to the whole subject, which is extremely important because, of course, there's much more going on than the kind of normal external eye can perceive, and uh, the, the, the visit, uh, the lunch with President Erdogan in Istanbul uh, was another such of, of many events that, that are going on. And you mentioned the halyard. This is not the first commemoration. There have been many. But what was interesting this time is that the commander-in-chief of US Special Ops for Europe was present there. So a very high-ranking uh, NATO, US official uh, participated in. And that, again, was a symbolically very important act. I won't go into the whole kind of uh, uh, Serbia trying to replicate some kind of non-aligned approach of four pillars and, you know, but uh, I'll just say that the strategic goal remains the European Union and then attempts to, to kind of be on good terms with, with everyone. And this U.S. development is extremely important and we can come back to that later in the discussion. Uh, last but not least, of course, uh, we have uh, Laris Geisner. So please, Laris, take the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Milutorica, for inviting us here. It's uh, absolutely amazing to see you not on Zoom, but by real in life. Uh, and uh, I'm really pleased to be here among you to discuss about uh, the future of the Balkans. The Balkans, uh, for somebody that is coming from the, the Balkans, are the center of the world, of course, and the most important region in the world. <laughs> and uh, are the future of our international relations and geopolitical stability. Well, the Balkans are the great theater, the great theater uh, where not everything is true, and you have to go through the fog in order to arrive and to join the true at the end. So everything that we have, we are seeing in this moment uh, uh, happening and going on on the Balkans, uh, it's a big theater. Well, the real truth is uh, that, of course, we have the major powers, uh, mainly Russia and China that are interested to be present and to, let's say, uh, destabilize the region for one simple reason, because the Balkans and the Central Europe are very much divided in little states and, let's say, not really uh, historically prepared and, of course, having not really more than one or one and a half uh, uh, political elite to lead the country. So let's say it's easy to destabilize this part of uh, the Euro-Atlantic uh, uh, region. That is, of course, uh, the final target of the great forces. Now, you have asked me to take the floor to speak a little bit about uh, a case that can be seen as a little bit passé, so the Slovenian study case. How was uh, the, uh, the path of Slovenia uh, joining the European Union and NATO. Well, I think it is not such a passé case. Um, despite the positive image of Slovenia as a uh, predestinated country for European Union and NATO, as a country that was leading, let's say, uh, economically the former Yugoslavia, as the country that was uh, Adacta immediately after the independence uh, to be a member of European Union and uh, NATO, well, the story is uh, quite, uh, quite different. Let me share with you uh, um, my personal moment a few years ago. I was uh, uh, having a dinner with uh, the former president of Catalonia, Charles Puigdemont. And Charles Puigdemont asked me in the months and the weeks before the, his declaration of independence uh, to support him, to give him advice uh, how to, to follow the Slovenian way of independence. And of course, I was asking him, well, in what sense? Because you are absolutely on the wrong, on the wrong, uh, on the wrong uh, uh, path in that case. Because I asked him, did Slovenia before the independence uh, had a clear parallel bureaucratic structure? 
Do you have a clear parallel bureaucratic structure for independence? No, was the answer. Well, Slovenia had a clear parallel military structure. Do you have a clear military structure ready? No. Good. Then, your point is for the future, what is? Well, tomorrow we will join uh, NATO and European Union. Let's say, well, that's then not the case of the Slovenian study case that you would like to follow, because Slovenia needed more than 14, 13 years to join EU and to join NATO. And they say, well, Mr. President, and then what is your uh, final uh, result of all this discussion? Well, we will declare independence. Let's say, well, you are on the wrong side. Because why the Slovenian path was so long? If everybody was so happy to accept Slovenia immediately in the beginning of the 90s as a, uh, let's say, a successful story, a new member of European Union and NATO. Because the problem was not so much in the international environment as in the Slovenia. And this is my point. I will now go deeper in this, my point. But the, the fact is that uh, all the country, once that they accept the destiny, the future, to join an organization, uh, EU or NATO, well, then they have to start to struggle inside. Because it's not a done job, especially from Slovenia to South. Slovenia is the limits, is the beginning of a different world. And uh, Slovenia went to the referendum in 2003, so 12 years after the Declaration of Independence, to ask the citizens to vote yes, no for you, and yes, no for NATO, the same day. Well, if Slovenia today is a member of NATO, we have to be grateful to the political elite of that time, not to the citizens. Let's say the political elite understood that Slovenia was absolutely pro-EU and not really pro-NATO. And we are talking about Slovenia, the northern member of Yugoslavian countries, uh, the most, let's say, developed, sorry for using this uh, uh, word, uh, it's um, absolutely not nice, but it's just to make clear the point. So somebody that was predestinated. For two years, the uh, Slovenian uh, politics, the Slovenian politicians, they uh, founded NGOs, they shaped organizations, they manipulated media and, and, uh, and public system in order to convince uh, the Slovenian citizens to vote yes for NATO. The final result at the same day, at the same referendum, was 90% of, of Slovenians, yes for EU, 60 for NATO. So it was really just a moment, a really hard job to be done by the political elite inside the country. And I think this is, let's say, a sort of benchmark for all the, uh, the future members uh, that are coming from the Balkan region. It was that they will decide uh, for, they have, of course, to shape the inside will uh, for, for such, such, such a step. What was the great plus of Slovenia? The great plus of Slovenia was that the outside environment was positive. EU was absolutely ready to accept Slovenia. Nobody was against, no, there was no second thought about that, uh, even for NATO if you want. Today, let's see the last five years in uh, how the perception of EU from the Balkan is. Well, the EU was a little bit unstable in uh, giving the heeding. The EU was uh, declaring that there is no future in that in the past five years during the Juncker Commission for any new enlargement. Something that we know, everybody knows, knew that. But it's something that you cannot declare in the Balkan region because you are closing an expectative, and you are changing the positive attitude of the region toward an institution that is very much important as EU. And that was the biggest mistake. The second biggest mistake was the attitude of EU in the Macedonian issue, and then a sort of vacuum where, of course, United States jumped in the last period, taking over the vacuum and launching the Free Seas Initiative. Because there was no real clear future given by Brussels to this region. So we have many mistakes. We have countries that have to fight inside in order to 
clearly choose to clearly choose this uh, future, but of course also the environment outside must be stable and clear, giving clear direction uh, and options for the future. So this is just from my side for the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Lars, very much. Thank you. So uh, we have half an hour, about half an hour for the question and answer session. Um, I'll just say a few words before I, I open the floor. And Laris, thank you very much for mentioning uh, all that you did and the, the Three Seas Initiative. But actually, what, what we're talking about and why this question has been posed for the title of this session about inclusion is exactly because of the vacuum that has happened in the EU simply slackening its attention towards the region for all the reasons that we know, whether it's the financial crisis, the migration crisis, the uh, Russian uh, incursion into Ukraine, the takeover of Crimea, what was happening in the Middle East, etc. Uh, but that opened the space for Russia, for Turkey, for China uh, to move in. And uh, I think it needs repeating. I, I don't think that Russia thinks that simply this region can join the Eurasian Union. Uh, it's clear where this region belongs in the Euro-Atlantic community, historically, geog uh, geographically, culturally, and the rest. Uh, Russia simply wants to be a nuisance, a spoiler, to show the weakness of the European Union, to show the weakness of NATO. Uh, China is different. They have a very long-term strategy of basically, uh, if I can be a little colloquial, of taking over the world by 2050. But, you know, uh, let's not hold our breath on, on that issue. And then you have the paradoxical example that the bridge that Croatia is building over that little sliver of Bosnia and Herzegovina that comes onto the Adriatic, uh, the bridge is being built by China but financed by the European Union. So, you know, th there are a lot of things like that that are going on. But I think we need to mention also something that was not mentioned here, and that are the other regional initiative, the Berlin Process. Germany, under Chancellor Merkel, realized that things were going slowly, so she initiated, and Germany initiated, the Berlin process. And in fact, the next meeting will be held in Sofia, in Bulgaria, in November, where all the, uh, the leaders meet with the chief European leaders. There is uh, what's called the Brdo Brioni initiative, where Slovenia and Croatia are extremely uh, active in bringing the leaders of the region together. And then there's the actual Western Balkan self-initiative, for better or for worse, called Mini Schengen, or I would call it rather regional economic cooperation, where <clears throat> the leaders realize that they need to initiate something by themselves to show that they are espousing European values. And that means sitting together, without any external help and saying, we want to make uh, capital, human, and financial flows easier so that we don't have trucks waiting for whatever it is, two, three days on the border uh, to cross into the other country. Initiated by President Vucic, uh, President Rama of Albania, and the then Prime Minister Zaev, who is again Prime Minister of North Macedonia, uh, that was now joined by Kosovo in Washington. Uh, the, this is very important, you know. Will it change things overnight? No, it won't. But I think it's important to show that this really micro region of 18 million people, which is a drop in the bucket compared to the 500 million uh, uh, citizens of the European Union, and economically weak, and can only become stronger if forces are joined. So the way to include better and faster is to both show bottom up initiative, but also top-down, where the European Union brings these countries to the table, as was most dramatically shown during the migration crisis, where the Balkan countries were, in my view, de facto members for that particular migration issue. Okay, enough from me. I'll open the floor. There are microphones to the left and the right, and please uh, give me a show of hands of who wants to ask uh, a question. Okay, I see a question right there, and then a second one here. Uh, so I ask you to stand up because I see the microphones are fixed. I apologize for that, but that is the only way in COVID times that we can do things like that. And do present yourself, please. Yes, uh, my name is Carlo Trezza. I'm 
a retired Italian ambassador. My first posting as a diplomat was to Africa, to Zambia, and uh, Italy was doing quite well. Italian companies were doing quite well uh, in that country. Our main competitor was uh, Yugoslavia. <laughs> in particular, I remember a company, I think called uh, Energo Project, who was really competing mm -hmm. very, uh, very seriously with our sure. companies. Now, uh, actually, uh, Mr. Chairman, you have already answered to the question that I wanted to uh, pose, and that is, uh, is there a common thread that can, uh, without going back, uh, without being, uh, let's say, no nostalgic about the Tuto, Tito area, uh, era, uh, whether there is a common thread that can somehow uh, create a critical mass of uh, this whole region? You already somehow answered to this question right now, but in any case, first, if uh, you and other members of the, uh, of the panel can elaborate on this and whether indeed uh, the project of joining the European Union can be this thread. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador, thank you very much. As uh, one says in Italy about non-alignment and uh, the times that you're mentioning, tempi passati. Uh, of course, we're in a completely new environment, and uh, is there anyone who would like to tackle the ambassador's question? Ambassador, would you like to say a few words on, on the foreign policy, for example, of the region, and Serbia in particular? Yes, yes, for sure. Um, thank you, Ambassador. And sometimes in Belgrade you feel there is some Yugo nostalgia, and that goes beyond the pure costume thing, yeah. because exactly what is missing is the role of, uh, of the country and of the region in the world. Uh, whenever I enter my office, now I can say that I entered my office at the USM mission, I had in front of me Palace of Serbia, which is somehow very symbolic um, and which was reminding me every morning where I was. Not only that I was in Belgrade, but I was in a country which is, feels itself as something different from the purely geographical dimension it has. Something very similar which happens to me in Vienna, I have to say where the country itself feels, of course, uh, its role, uh, and rightly so, in a different way than what, which is where headquarters of OSE are hosted, so I had the pleasure to go very often recently, and I hope to have very soon uh, the same pleasure, and uh, um, as I hope to see Palace of Serbia very soon again, but that's exactly the way, it's, not, it's something deeper, because it shows the will to play a role which means, yes, to play an economic role, but also to, to play a regional role. Serbia itself knows very well that it has a role to play in the region. There is no other option than that. And I have to say that Serbia tends to be very responsible in playing this role, even in difficult times. And at the same time, uh, there is this, uh, this uh, Balkan centrism, of course, thinking that it is uh, where Europe will play its future, but certainly, uh, so it is very hard to imagine uh, a, a, fuel, a fully accomplished uh, European Union, for instance, without that area. The OSCE is very neutral in terms of EU integration. What we try to do is to help Serbia to be fit to decide about its own future. Then I can have my personal preferences, of course. But at the same time, the official line is very clear and has been repeated many, many times. EU integration is the... Uh, leading force for Serbia, certainly not the Euro-Atlantic one for reasons which we all know. At the same time, I was serving in NATO, I remember a very, very fruitful cooperation, both on the civilian side and on the military side, between uh, uh, Serbia armed forces and, uh, and government and authorities and NATO, a very good cordial working relationship, certainly, but very, very intense one. And uh, the, the, this nostalgia is not something, there are now books and books, uh, which I had now as a wonderful gift, which think of that. It's something much more than thinking with uh, uh, nostalgia uh, at past. It's really something to, to find its own role and space. And the region is very well aware, I think, that only together, as I, had, you know, as I always say, my favorite Serbian word, can play a role there. At the same time, as you rightly said, there was clearly I mean, if there is a vacuum, a vacuum never stays empty. 
And of course, all other actors entered, not because of great plans, plots. You know, plot theories are always very uh, well nourished in the Balkans as well. No, just because there was a space to be fulfilled. And there was economic space, political space, cultural space, um, religious space as well. What I saw on the ground is very simple. Whenever the EU integration path is stronger, reforms advance. Whenever uh, the European uh, perspective becomes weaker, then you see that things uh, get different. Now, it's not up to me to see whether there is a connection or a nexus between the two, but this is certainly from the factual point of view, which I could see in the last four years, day by day. Does anyone else want to add a may word on may that? I? Yeah, sure. Uh, just an addendum. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely agree. There is this nostalgia, nostalgia that is uh, present all over the region. Uh, but sometimes, more than in the political elite, and now I'm going back, sorry, to, to, my, to my topic, uh, many times in, in, the, in the citizens, in the, in the hearts of the citizens, because the problem is this in orientation. In, for, let's say, 50 years, they have been at the center, sorry, again, at the center of the world, but in the, in the sense of the geopolitical game, you know, between the East and between the Ovest and the West. So they were important. They felt, as you described, to be inside a great system, a great game. And then at a certain point, this country, these citizens, and this also political elites, of course, why not, they lost the positioning in the map, on the world map. And they're trying still, not understanding very well, maybe sometimes geopolitics, and I'm, I'm not speaking about uh, Serbia that is understanding perfectly, but let's say sometimes uh, Slovenia, let's say Croatia, etc. They're trying to be still big as they were in the past, not being anymore in that kind of world. So yes, there is these tensions. You can feel these tensions in the regions, for sure. OK, before I go to, to the next question, I have a question uh, from our virtual uh, Zoom world, uh, which asks, do you think China's economic potential might have an impact on territorial disputes with the Balkans? And I'd like Val Valerie to tackle that question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for giving me the hard one. I just wanted to actually make one point sure. about this uh, previous question, which I, I do think is interesting. Um, and I think that there, there are some in the region who, who, who don't share always this n nostalgia and who actually have feared this idea of mini-Schengen because they feel it will be mostly something that will be used to benefit Serbia, who has the biggest economy in the region and is probably the most ready to... Um, invest I across the region. Um, however, I, I think that one of the, I've been following this Kosovo-Serbia dialogue since 2013, yeah, and, and one of the most consistent and, and powerful and positive forces for the negotiations have been the business communities of both Kosovo and Serbia. Um, and that's why you saw the president of the Serbian Chamber of Commerce in Washington. I'm not sure if the president of the Kosovo Chamber was there, but he was anyways in Belgrade this week. And they've been uh, working together quite a lot. And when you talk to them and when you talk to the business people that they bring, it's very clear that, that especially in Kosovo, but, but also elsewhere, none of the companies can truly scale up, you know, whether it's uh, being able to buy glass bottles or whatever to make fresh juice or, or you know, to, to have access to an import market. I, it is a, quite a positive force, but I think it will take so many years because uh, for almost all the countries, at least 70, almost 67 in Serbia, 67% of the trade is with the EU. Yeah. So it's possible that it would grow, but I, it, I don't know that it would grow to become uh, such a strong, so strong. But, but still, I think it's a positive uh, sign and should be renewed. As for China, economic potential, I, I think it really depends on on what you ended your speech with, actually. The, the fact that we kind of don't know where the global order is going and, and whether we will continue to, to operate in this rules-based international order. I think already you see that uh, some of the momentum can sometimes uh, feel like it's shifting, whether that's um, uh, Washington's position towards uh, certain countries in the Balkans, namely you know, reopening to Serbia and, and, and making, tightening the ties with Serbia while not always publicly anyway um, reaffirming its same commitments to Kosovo. Um, I think it depends a lot on who wins in November as well. Maybe I'm too granular. I know that I need to back up and see the big picture, but I, I do think that 
that, uh, that the result of what happens in November will uh, be a tremendous factor in, in China's economic potential. And I think, I think it will also depend on the future kinds of contracts that are signed. I think, you know, now that all the countries in the regions can, region can see the example of Montenegro, which uh, signed an incredibly detrimental contract, including, you know, um, the potential to hand off part of its territory to China, a non-military territory to China, if it doesn't make good on its loan commitments. Um, uh, you, you know, some of the other state-to-state uh, -state contracts in the region are, are not public, and we don't know what they say. Um, and it will, it will also depend on what kind of leverage Beijing will be able to um, exert on some of these countries. But um, I don't see any immediate um, impact on the territory. So I would like to ask you, though. <laughs> no, I, well, I, I think there, there are two things to say very briefly. Uh, first of all, you know, there's a lot of talk about the third actor, the Chinas and the Russias in, in the region. But you know, there's, there's the bigger framework, and I think you mentioned it, Ahmed, the 17 plus 1. So there are a number of EU member and NATO states that are negotiating about investments. There is, you know, China bought Volvo and Saab 10 years ago, uh, many other European companies. So they are actually working on a much bigger field. The Balkans is a small playground for them, uh, admittedly, in, in an attempt to, to upscale uh, their, their activities. And we know what happened in the United Kingdom when Xi Jinping was, you know, uh, driven off to, to Buckingham Palace and, and hoping for all sorts of investments. So there, there's a much bigger game that's being played and I think we need to take that always into consideration when we're uh, discussing these issues. The second question is all these countries need infrastructure, railways, highways, if they want to upscale their activities and get, get more investments. And uh, that's where a lot of the subsidies happen. The, the best example uh, of this is the, the so-called Nabucco pipeline that was going to be a Western investment, that was going to uh, show diversification of energy supply. And apart from being you know, a, a Verdi opera, Nabucco, it was this pipeline that never happened. The West simply said, well, actually, this is not economically profitable investment and we're pulling out. Vacuum, who steps in? Russia, South Stream, that also Russia said, well, it's not profitable, they kicked that. Now we have Turkish Stream uh, or, if, uh, or, or anything else. So these countries are in desperate need of bridges, of roads, sure. of, of pipelines, and, and of railways. And if they are not Western investments, somebody else is going to uh, offer to uh, build that highway from the Montenegrin coast up to Serbia and to the north, or the railway for Serbia down to Duras, mm -hmm. the port in Albania, or the highway you know, that was actually promised, if I can put it that way, in Berlin, and the first Berlin process conference, uh, Niche to Pristina, financed largely by EIB and others, mm -hmm. now the US has stepped in. The good thing I like to say about the kind of enhanced activity of the United States is that it kicked Europe into a certain place and Europe woke up and said, oh my goodness, you know, the Americans are, to speak all too simply, going to overtake us in dealing with, with the Balkans. And so the Europe, I really see it, has woken up. Uh, Miroslav Lajcik, uh, many of us uh, are, are friends with him. Uh, he served as ambassador to Belgrade many years ago is now really taking this uh, at a much higher speed. He has met uh, in, in summit form already three or four times with the leaders of, of Serbia and, and Kosovo. And I think that's exactly what we need, much more vigorous activity by the European Union. And to repeat what all of us have been saying is better selling of Europe of what it's doing. Because Europe is the biggest trade partner yeah. It has given the biggest COVID assistance to the region, and yet people think it's it's the other way around. So you know, you know, let's hire a PR consultant for Brussels maybe to, to do some work uh, on, on what they do. Okay, uh, we have a, a question there, and we have ten minutes left, as I'm reminded by. Please go ahead yes, and do uh, introduce yourself. Mauricio Cherry from Eurogard Information Center. My question is about the possible role of Italy. Uh, this country in supporting uh, 
some Balkan countries that are in NATO but not in European Union. So Italy is one of the founders of European Union and is one of the most important allies. But there are countries that are in NATO, like Montenegro, North Macedonia, Albania, are not, not yet in the European Union. So many times NATO is the first step to enter into integration. What could be the role of Italy or other allies, for that matter, in supporting the integration of these countries? And if I can short also another one for Mr. Laris regarding the domestic institutions. I completely agree, and uh, um, my question is about the possible role of civil society in strengthening these institutions before to enter international organizations. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Extremely important question. Italy, indeed, as you reminded us, is a very important country for this whole region. Uh, I'm just reminded that there was an electricity link uh, made recently between uh, the coast somewhere in Ancona and Montenegro, which again shows mm -hmm. the intensity uh, about which people do not know very much about. But let me may, may start I? with yeah. Laris. May yeah. I, I also can uh, try to answer the, the point on the Italy. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm trying, I'm fighting already decades this fight uh, with uh, Farnesina, with the government uh, of Italy okay. everywhere, etc., etc. Because uh, Italy is or the first or the second commercial partner with, the, the, uh, with the, all the countries in the, real, let's say, ex-Yugoslavia region. Uh, what is the result for Italy? More or less nothing. Um, Germany is sometimes the third or the fourth partner, but the result for Germany is much higher. Political, geopolitical, and uh, let's say cultural result. If you talk with the citizens, let's say, I, I know Slovenia, Croatia, etc. Uh, about Italy and about Germany, well, let's say the attitude is absolutely different. Oh, yes, Germany is great, and Italy, well, what we, have, what we can do with Italy. The point is the strategic approach of Italy toward the region. And that is, unfortunately, a problem since, I think, at least 15 years uh, uh, in our foreign policy. And uh, for sure there is a great opportunity. For sure Italy has to, to be involved. For sure Italy has to change the approach. I wrote just now an article, uh, I think two, two, two numbers ago, with Limes, where I'm trying now to explain that there is another opportunity coming, right? Given this, uh, this, uh, this uh, fundamental, very good economic fundamentals uh, that Italy has in the region, where very likely, due to the old geopolitical situation in the world, there will be a sort of uh, back, um, back shoring and uh, reshoring moment uh, coming, let's say, from Asia. And uh, for the Italian companies, let's say, of course, this is the, uh, the courtyard where we can play and where we can, we can uh, put our companies. And let's say, in this way, we have a win-win situation. We have our companies in, in, our, uh, in our neighborhood, and we are helping the neighborhood to develop and to make stronger links uh, uh, with Italy. Uh, otherwise, uh, concerning the civil society, let me give you a very clear example. Uh, there is um, the oldest European, uh, pan-European movement, I'm also president of the Slovenian branch, that was, so this is the confirmation of your point of view, that was the window of opportunity of the, for the democratization of Slovenia, and let's say also of the collapse of Yugoslavia. Because, let me make a little bit of story very quickly, uh, the first president of the Slovenian democratically elected parliament was Francie Bucar. Francie Bucar was the president of pan-Europa Slovenia. Pan Europa Slovenia has been uh, constituted by Otto von Habsburg, that was at that time the member of the European Parliament and president of the International Pan Europa. And that was the window of opportunity in the end of the 80s where the democratization started for Slovenia. And Franze Bucar was the first person from, coming from, the, let's say, on the other side of the Iron Court to have a speech in the Strasbourg Parliament against a system of the East. And, and that occasion, in 1988, he asked the European Union, not to, let's say, of course, European communities, not to finance any more Yugoslavian system. That was the first act. So let's say, it was an NGO that started the democratization in Slovenia in the political, civil, civil way. So yes, absolutely, there is a huge opportunity for NGOs to work on that, yes. Okay, and because we're short of time, we'll do the final round, uh, and so you can answer a question and give your final thoughts. Ambassador. 
Well, exactly on the role of Italy, maybe. In the last four years, I have not been representing Italy, so I, I had to have a much more comprehensive <laughs> vision. And I can say that uh, sometimes we Italians are a little bit too modest in what we do, because I have to say that there is not one single project which is really going to substance which is done without Italy, which was started before I came, not because of me, certainly, then I gave uh, some, some hint, but not only as an Italian. The fact that I was Italian certainly helped the mission to have open doors when they're not mm -hmm. easily open and to give difficult messages with the right tone and with the right understanding of the situation. And I have to say that certainly Italy has been playing a, an essential role in the advancement of Euro integration, European and euro atlantic integration of the region and is called to play it. It's a, a vital interest for Italy. What is certainly also true, what you were mentioning, is that public opinion is sometimes not very well aware of it. And, and certainly you are talking about communication. Mm -hmm. Certainly communication, there is a lot to do. But I have to say that on substance, not only this is something which is very clear in the region, and should be sometimes clearer in Italy, but it's something which is needed. Berlin process you were mentioning. In the first, first summit, Italy was not present. It was the region asking Italy to be present. And I think the uh, process gained a lot after that. I will stop here. I'm not yet representing Italy, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I will Two stop here. <laughs> uh -huh. Let me come to two, two things very briefly, uh, again, uh, to, to China uh, with respect to the question. Yes, potentially, but when? Uh, China could, uh, in fact, uh, uh, have an effect on uh, the Balkans uh, bringing coherence there. That is the intention, of course. The Chin China's intention is to establish a continuous economic zone throughout uh, uh, the supercontinent, uh, Eurasia. But they know that they cannot do that by 2050. It is, in fact, the, uh, a century-long project that is very difficult for us to conceive because we have projects, political and economic projects, uh, not longer than four years from election to election. Uh, but China has this uh, thing. Yes, potentially in the uh, 22nd century. The, there was a question there on uh, Gulf. the uh, Gulf. Gulf uh, yeah, it was really interesting. Uh, I don't know whether the Gulf uh, is uh, is interested in particularly the Balkans. They are interested in, of course, coming to the Mediterranean. Um, a uh, two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, they have a lot of money and they want to uh, have a space for investment for that money uh, that is larger than um, the, their position in the Gulf, which they feel imprisoned between uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, the Persian Gulf, Persia on the other side. Uh, that is one. Uh, and number two, they're very active, of course, uh, to prevent a, um, a, a resurgence of uh, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, particularly uh, the fires of which are being stoked by Erdogan. Yeah. Valerie. Thanks. I will again z zoom in a little bit and, and just say that I, I think, um, as you said, it's, it's incredibly valuable and important now to, to not take the eye off the ball of the Balkans. I think we are, all of us, going into a very uncertain period, but I think in the Balkans it can be especially dangerous and explosive. Montenegro's economy, I think, is set to contract by 10%. Uh, most of the economies in the region, besides Serbia, which is only 6.4, and um, will be facing quite a lot of... Um, of, of problems and struggles, and it could result, I think, in, in quite a lot of, of dissatisfaction and frustration. Um, and I think, you know, this is a very crucial time for, for, for the West to kind of, f with, with not necessarily so much effort and not necessarily so much money to, to, to project um, the influence that it wants to have in the region. I think this is a, yeah, very fundamental time, so. Well, two final thoughts uh, from me, uh, and I hope the organizers don't chastise us for running over two, three minutes. Uh, Italy, extremely important, I would like to, to say, uh, from my part, in, in every regard, it's at the top of the trade partners, along with Germany, as, as Laris said. 
uh, in every regard. Plus, they're, they're the historical and cultural ties, not only with the whole XU, but also with the individual countries. Coming from Serbia, I think we're very proud to have the only big car factory in former Yugoslavia, the Fiat. The 500L is produced in Kragujevac that you see around town. So just hopefully that the car industry worldwide yeah. <laughs> continues to maintain a, a certain level. And, and secondly, uh, regardless of what public opinion is, and we know that it's often very superficial, as I may say so, the EU is the main actor in every regard, uh, in whichever way you look at it, not only trade and politically, I always say that if we were to vote on Sunday whether we want to join the European Union in any of our countries, you would have a massive majority for it, no matter what the daily public opinion poll is. Because people have the common sense to know yeah. that it is better to be part of a union, which is your immediate neighbor of half a billion people, the Brits are still in, um, than to remain the only uh, inhabitant of a high-rise where everybody else is part of a club. So please join me in thanking our panel, and we have a coffee break now.
Can you hear me? So if you could please take your seats. Balbona needs to be mic'd up. Sorry? Balbona wasn't mic'd up. In just one minute, can you hear me? He smiled. Okay. Now I can hear you. Okay, I believe we'll start. Uh, welcome back, and welcome to the interview before the second panel discussion. We have, uh, we're fortunate to have with us today uh, Mr. Damon Wilson from Washington, close to my home. Uh, he, uh, Mr. Wilson is the Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council. Uh, he has worked at the U.S. National Security Council on European affairs, including uh, Central and Eastern European affairs. He has worked in the Office of the NATO Secretary General also on NATO expansion. Um, so we now have after an interesting discussion this morning, uh, we now have the opportunity to hear a, a view directly from Washington, but which I, I would note, and I, and I say this in my first question to you, Mr. Wilson, um, which, which has a lot to do with, and, and is very concentrated on the European Union itself. It's somewhat surprising if you look at the, um, the summit that the Atlantic Council recently held uh, on, on Balkan integration, the, one of the, the key, key uh, issues which was focused on are the four freedoms of the European Union. So from a time when many people would expect that, the, that in Washington there is little attention to what's going on in the EU, we see that actually there's, there's room for a great deal of collaboration. So maybe I, I would ask you just to, um, if you'd like to start out just telling us about, telling us about your, your summit, what progress was made? Sure, thank you very much, Andrew. Hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you and the NATO Defense College Foundation from Washington. I just uh, have to be truthful and say that I wish I were with you there in Rome. Uh, I'd rather be in person for this, uh, for this event, but I really wanna thank the leadership of Ambassador uh, Alessandro Minutorizzo, uh, with whom I had the opportunity to work while I was at NATO when he was Deputy Secretary General uh, for his continuing leadership and spotlight on the Western Balkans. And Andrew, your, your question hits at the heart. You know, I'm here in Washington at a time when we're in the crazy season. We're in the uh, midst of a heated campaign. Uh, we've had uh, a series of real challenges in this country uh, from the handling of COVID, the economic uh, challenges that stem from that, the anti-racist movement, the racial upheaval we've seen here in this country and now headed to election day. And so you ask your question about Americans, our role in the Balkans and how we think about the European Union. And first, I want to say we come to this with a clear conviction that the United States must remain engaged. It's in American interest to remain engaged. But we also come to this with a degree of humility and understanding that it's really the people of the region that are going to drive this agenda and that the ultimate destination is the European Union. It's a Europe whole and free. And so we see our role at the Atlanta Council uh, as being one that is a facilitator, uh, a catalyst uh, for stronger US-EU uh, cooperation to advance reform in the region and in turn uh, integration into the, the Euro-Atlantic community. And that's why you see the Atlantic Council through the summit we hosted with the six the Western Balkan six and leaders from all the regions really looking to give oxygen and give energy to ideas from the leaders themselves, how to promote a more rapid economic recovery out of COVID uh, through uh, breaking down regional barriers to trying to create a more credible and viable internal market uh, to uh, be more attractive uh, to investors. Uh, and so that's what we look to champion. Some of those ideas from the region that we think have merit, but also advance their aspirations mm -hmm. over time to be closer to Europe and closer to the European Union because we see transatlantic interests aligned in that respect. So that's why the Atlantic Council brought these leaders together as a, to some, some respects to raise the level of political ambition uh, over this idea of how to, to promote 
a more integrated uh, regional economic space uh, as a way to, to facilitate uh, a greater, uh, more efficient use of recovery funds coming over out of COVID before the SOFIA summit, but also a way to show the Americans supporting that European strategy. Can everyone hear okay? Is it, no, it's not loud enough. Possiamo alzare un po' il volume. We will, we'll try to get up the volume. Okay, there we go. Yes, that's a little better. Um, I'll try to project as well. Okay, just very briefly, could you give us a little bit of detail on the type of uh, discussions you had in terms of infrastructure and connections? Uh, just We have a, a, an audience of experts here, so I'm sure they'd be interested to go into a little bit more detail. Sure, sure. So yes, uh, we brought together these six leaders um, essentially at their own uh, urging. And this is their, on their pathway to the SOFIA Summit um, uh, this fall, actually next month, uh, with a, an effort to try to identify some of the obstacles that they had uh, in reaching these agreements. Part of the significance of the Western Balkan Six Summit was that all countries came to the table, including Kosovo, uh, which was quite significant. We did spend some time uh, behind the scenes working with the, the delegations to get them all to understand uh, the economics that, that there could be greater economic benefit to regional growth. And so part of it was a political step to get them all on board with a common agenda and to really then begin to lay out what the next step of that could be. One of the big ideas uh, is how to um, remove, connect, uh, remove some of the barriers of the Western Balkan Six to their EU neighbors. And that will be one of the asks that I think they bring to the table in Sofia of what they could do to facilitate uh, these so-called green lanes that allowed for expedited uh, transport across uh, borders during the COVID crisis and how much of that can be made permanent. That's part of the negotiation. That's part of what we got commitments to at the summit. But now they would like to see, is there an, a possibility to extend some of these uh, with their EU neighbors as well, which would be quite significant. So we have something new, of course, that has happened uh, from Washington and in the area. The, the Serbia-Kosovo agreement, uh, somewhat a surprise to some people. I had a colleague, uh, a Serbian colleague, who said, well, Vucic could never recognize Kosovo as a country, but something has happened here. What, how big a step forward is this? You know, look, this is, um, you know, this is a pretty significant development. And I know in some cases, in some places in Europe, there's been a lot of skepticism um, and it's not been healthy that there's been a little bit of a gap, if you will, between uh, the Europeans and Americans in coordinating their strategy. But there has been some healthy competition to serve as a catalyst for diplomacy, both in Brussels and in Washington. And so what happened here at the White House is significant in that it really helps reinforce a process, a process of normalization, this time the focus on the economic side between Kosovo and Serbia creating the habits of cooperation, the regularity of breaking down some of the political taboos uh, and getting people focused on the fact that they have some common economic interests together. Um, and so this is not a, um, you know, this is not a, a, a comprehensive agreement that's completely done, but it does help generate some momentum and some positive movement. And I think that's a good thing to be welcomed and to be built upon. I think the heavy lifting does remain on Miroslav Vychuk's shoulders and the EU's shoulders to move forward the formal process. But it's, uh, I think there's a sense here um, uh, that this also is a way to, to begin to build a fundamentally different relationship with Serbia. The United States has been extraordinarily close to Kosovo for obvious reasons since 99, uh, supporting uh, Kosovo in 99. Uh, to stop fighting, to, to, to stand by its unilateral declaration of independence, uh, to support Kosovo in its first two decades. And part of what's been playing out over the past couple of years is normalization of a U.S.-Serbian relationship, which is also significant. And, and I think that's one of the things that sometimes gets lost in the equation, that that's another part of the normalization that's unfolding, something that hopefully will be bipartisan here in the United States. The... Uh... The Trump administration, without going into the, the internal political part, but has certainly taken a, a, a new approach in foreign policy, which, uh, and we've seen this in various other places, of, of offering, you know, first using tough talk, but then offering economic development, offering incentives, offering aid. Um, I've called it someplace, make, make money, not war, or uh, to be even a little bit blasphemous here in Rome, we could ask, well, is this a sort of peace through development? Is this, is this the approach that you see coming? 
look, these things don't work all by themselves. And that's why I think that there has to be an overarching strategy and some things that play off each other. Um, a few trade deals do not resolve all the political challenges of the Balkans. On the other hand, part of this is creating momentum, creating a track record, creating habits of cooperation, building confidence as we can go through one set of steps to another, and that they can hopefully build upon each other towards a comprehensive uh, 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 set of arrangements. Um, and so, uh, you know, some can uh, poo poo and some can exaggerate what happened. But on the other hand, I, I prefer to see this as a bit of a longer term process where at least now we're dealing with the specifics of agreements between former antagonists. Uh, and hopefully that that creates some momentum and some confidence that can allow for the next set of agreements. So uh, the White House rightly put a, a emphasis on the economic trade to try to uh, provide a little bit more of an economic incentive for why there needs to be a more normal relationship between Kosovo and Serbia, um, while recognizing that a lot of the, the some of the difficult political issues very much remained on the agenda in the Brussels dialogue. So it's a, a process, a process of dialogue. We were reminded in the first panel that this process uh, sees internal, there's the internal question in various countries of, of accepting this moving forward and the, the elites in these countries, the institutions, being able to convince the population. There were recently elections in North Macedonia, in Montenegro. How do you see those, maybe in two different ways, uh, how do you see those as moving this process forward or creating red flags? Well, uh, look, I think you hit the nail on the uh, head when you basically said it's, you, it's part of preparing the people. And I think sometimes that's not always been done, particularly in a Kosovo-Serbia context, of preparing the populations for what normalization looks like, uh, for what this means between the two countries. And so that is part of the process that's unfolding, is to help people understand what's coming, what it means, what the implications are, uh, what the benefits are, what some of the trade-offs are, and getting a public debate going inside Kosovo and Serbia, where obviously any progress on a bilateral agenda is super controversial in both countries. And we, uh, you know, we've seen how, in some respects, vibrant uh, Kosovo's democracy is. It's really uh, difficult to, to keep uh, 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 a common approach uh, towards some, uh, a controversial issue like the agenda with Serbia. And so I think this is an important piece of the equation. Um, you mentioned the elections in North Macedonia and Montenegro. Um, this is part of part and parcel as we've been through really traumatic uh, populist backlashes across the transatlantic space in my own country. Uh, overlay that with COVID and all the economic challenges. This is a really difficult time uh, uh, for uh, folks to face, um, face their electorates. And yet that's the fundamental um, difference of what it means to be part of your part of this transatlantic community. And so we've seen this play out, out in a volatile process in North Macedonia and Montenegro. And ultimately, it's a healthy, constructive process. We saw a government that took great risk uh, to reach a normalization agreement with Greece and the Prespa Accords. Um, and it was able to hold on and to be reelected uh, in Skopje. And now to hopefully move forward on a deepening reform agenda to accelerate, build on its NATO membership and accelerate its pathway towards the European Union. Not going to be easy. Uh, in Montenegro, these are watershed elections, also super complicated. You know, in some respects, seeing change in Montenegro can be a good thing when you've had a, a party in power as long as it's been. And yet this is very complicated given the nature and diverse interests of an opposition, some of whom didn't even believe in the existence of a Montenegrin state. And so this is messy, this is murky, but that is what democracy is, that's what elections are. And I think, I feel pretty good that these, uh, these countries are gonna make it through that. Part of what we had seen in the Balkans over the past couple of years was an erosion of uh, democratic institutions. I think in part a reflection of what was happening across Europe and in my own country. And if we can get this right in the core, I hope that we'll see this in the, in the Balkans as well. People going to participate in elections, participating in parliaments, making the democratic institutions work so the checks and balances function. And it's not just all about boycotts or undermining the existing institutions. So that's what's unfolding in, in North Macedonia and Montenegro in very different ways. It will be difficult, but I'm optimistic that this is a really positive development overall for the region. Okay. We don't have a lot of time left, but there, there are two things I'd like to ask you to, to comment on. One, you've worked in China also, and uh, it's, been, it's been touched on a bit before, but the, the 
role of China, China's increasing role in the Balkans, and in particular as it regards NATO, and NATO which is now beginning to focus on China, uh, and the idea that maybe in the future it will be more focused on China than, uh, than on Russia, and how this plays out in the Balkans. You know, I think this is a, a huge issue, and in my own country you've seen a sea change in the debate where issue number one, two, and three is China, essentially. Um, and you're seeing a relitigation of how the United States is going to manage a relationship with China that's hugely interdependent on the economic side in ways that raises concerns in certain, in, in a lot of industries, in a lot of areas, as we have a heated debate on global supply chains and Chinese record. But we also see the challenge that China presents on the political and security uh, side. And I think that's what's at stake here. Um, any open economy needs to be able to benefit from certain Chinese investments. But what we've seen is that these come with strings attached, they come with a political agenda and their long-term security implications. So the issue is not to do it. The issue is how to do it in common concert with other democracies so that we have a common approach to how to engage China and where that's okay and where that can help for job growth and development of infrastructure and where it's a problem and where we have to protect uh, uh, secure industries, protect secure communications, the 5G issue. And so I think this is where we shouldn't expect one Balkan country to be able to manage on its own in a negotiation with China. We need a concerted, united approach between the United States, NATO, the European Union, and EU aspirants and the Balkans itself on how we're going to deal with this so that China's influence is not one of manipulation and distortion of markets, uh, but can be one of helping to accelerate development. This is why I think the United States showing up with the, the Overseas Development Finance Corporation, putting an office in Belgrade to cover the entire region is a very important development to help focus on private capital, private investment, which brings economic rule of law, which is really important to the long-term development of these economies. And that's a different model that you're seeing on offer uh, from some of the Chinese approach. My final question to see if I can get you to give us an optimistic view for the, the, the years or decades ahead. There's been talk with the Abraham Accords of what the Middle East could look like sometime in the future, with comparing it to, to Europe uh, after, you know, decades after, after World War II. What can the Balkans look like in 20, 30 years? You know, in some respects, we can be proud of uh, how far the Balkans has come since the bloody wars of the 90. Uh, in other respects, we can still be disappointed and want to have high standards. And I think it is important to remember that the entire European experiment, the whole vision of a European coal and steel community, of the European Union, of NATO itself, is in a process in which former historic adversaries become partners, become intertwined economically, and really become allies. And I think ultimately what we're seeing is that the economic future of the Western Balkans is in an integrated economic marketplace linked into European supply chains as part of a, a democratic trading regime. But it also um, augurs in the sense that that needs to come with some historic reconciliation and some deeper, deeper political ties. That's through the process of EU enlargement, through the process of building the partnerships with the NATO alliance. And I think ultimately, Part of what we need to understand is that there, is, there are tectonic shifts happening in this world. And you can't lose sight that the Balkans is the, the, the place where everything's unfolding. There's a much bigger set of issues at stake. And we need the free world. And the Balkans are part of this free world of Europe whole and free to be aligned with how we're going to actually deal with some of these greater global challenges. And that, I think, puts an urgency on accelerating the process of normalization, integration, economic development an EU uh, accession process. And that's something that I hope to see the United States support uh, regardless. Okay, well, thank you. Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council, thank you very much for being with us today. My pleasure with joining you. Thank you for having me on. And for my part, thank you, uh, Alessandro Minuturizzo, Ambassadore, and the NATO Defense College Foundation for involving me. Now, we move on.
Bener ya, benar. Okay, there it is. Great seeing um, Arne Sonnes Bjornstad uh, online from Oslo. I think we can start here with our second panel. Um, first of all, let me uh, thank the organizers for having me here. I know you wanted to have Ambassador Wolfgang Petrich, uh, my former boss, uh, both in Belgrade and for the Kosovo talks. Uh, but then settled on me since he had uh, to cancel his participation. But for me, it's a great pleasure to be here, um, um, back in Europe, in, in Italy, um, a country uh, with, uh, with, with which Austria shares so much in common, and not the least um, a, a vivid interest in the Balkans, um, where we have the, the same goal and the same uh, uh, energy to push the region forward. Um, we have a very interesting panel, so I will not uh, steal any of your time. Um, we have uh, uh, online from Oslo, uh, we have uh, um, um, Norway's special representative for the Western Balkans, um, Arne Sanes Bjornstad, who was um, prior to that uh, the Norwegian ambassador to Serbia, co credited to Montenegro and North Macedonia. Then we have to my far left here, or your far right, um, um, Remzilani who is uh, the executive director of the Albanian Media Institute. He has a long career in journalism and uh, authors, and uh, in the Balkan circuit, he is ubiquitous. Then we have, uh, to my left, to your right, my immediate left and your immediate right, Valbona Zenelli, um, who hails from Albania, was uh, in her previous years advisor to Albanian prime ministers and uh, ministers, um, and joined uh, in 2011 uh, the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies, where she is now the chair in Garmisch Partenkirchen. And last but not least, to my right, to, to your left, we have uh, Lubomir Ivanov, um, who is uh, um, the, currently the permanent representative of Bul Bulgaria to the FAO, but uh, more importantly for, for our uh, discussion here, he was uh, the lead coordinator for the negotiation of the accession of Bulgaria into NATO and the first permanent representative of his country to Brussels, NATO. Um, so uh, with this short introduction, um, I want to start the discussion um, according to the program you have in front of you and start with Arne in Oslo um, to talk about um, the societal pressures versus the establishment's resistance in the Balkans. This is a very uh, interesting uh, frame, uh, framing of, of your intervention. Um, please, Arne, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just start by, um, by congratulating NATO for succeeding in actually uh, organizing these uh, events during these um, very special times. And I also want to express my gratitude for having invited me. And unfortunately, actually due to the health crisis that I couldn't come because of another meeting. But um, I'm very pleased to attend by, um, by this modern ways communication, which becomes increasingly dependent on uh, now. Well, let me start just by saying that, you know, there, there are lots of polls taken on the Western Balkans and they consistently show that the population, they lack belief. In, the, in a better future for themselves and for the children in their own country. There are frustrations with the corruption, nepotism, and other kind of misuse of power. It's ruling elite that is more interested in obtaining and keeping power than actually uh, changing society. It's the legal system that doesn't work for most people. And of course, the frustration with kind of low, in European perspective, uh, quality of life. Many vote with defeat. They want a better life, and instead of staying and hoping for a better life locally, they go seek a better life in Western Europe, if they can. 
sometimes they also vote for change. And you know, there are good examples like the elections in North Macedonia in 2016, in Kosovo last year, and Montenegro this year. These were actually elections for change. But the we, we see that actually while actually complaining about the leaders, many still vote for them. It could be partly because many trust the opposition even less than the party in power. And it is actually easy to understand because experience shows that a winning government, former opposition parties, has been quite good and, and actually quickly uh, taken on actually the uh, structures of power rather than dismantling them. We, we know that actually other feel that they are actually clients, his clientelistic societies. And although they're not happy, they are afraid of losing their jobs or other kind of benefits if there would be a change of power. We should not forget neither that actually societal pressure do not actually go in one direction. You know, these are conservative societies. They've gone through diff difficult upheavals in the last 30 years. Many of them are preoccupied by identity issues, and they have actually possibly, to put it like this, stronger belief in rule of, uh, in um, law and order than in rule of law. In many ways, you know, if you take the EU as an example, they would resemble Poland and Hungary more than uh, Sweden and Austria. And so does public opinion. A substantial part of the electorate also lives in less developed part of the countries where actually both economy and opinions are less in step with Western Europe than in the capital and surroundings where we usually actually get our information from. And there are different kinds of opposition. And you, if you look at the different countries, you will see that in the countryside, actually the opposition, which are actually more nationalistic than the government and more populistic, is usually more popular than the uh, what we would call pro-Western liberal opposition. So if you want to help Western Balkans to achieve stability and sustainable economic progress, we need to engage both the general public, the opposition parties and the ruling elites. The general public must feel safe enough to vote according to the conscience. And this actually demands more than just having some observers present on election day. We need to take away the fear of being sacked for voting wrong. We have to be consistent with opposition parties and actually demand that they behave honestly and constructively, not populist and vindictive. And the ruling elite, we have to actually make credible threats that actually it's, it's worse for them staying in power and refusing a due, uh, a due uh, an election uh, loss than actually just um, leaving power and accepting whatever con consequence there will be. In a certain sense, I would say that, um, although this might actually be somewhat controversial, I'm not sure if what happened with Grevsky has actually um, helped us actually achieving changes of power in other countries in the Western Balkans. But these are challenges which we have to take up. It means that we have to uh, speak both with the governments, but also actually reach out to the population. And I think actually one of the uh, the difficulty we're facing, you know, as diplomats, as, as foreign, foreigners, basically, in these countries is that we tend to speak to those who are either in government or actually already convinced of what we're telling them. We need to be much better in reaching out and actually supporting, actually, partly those who want change in the liberal uh, direction. But we also actually need to build up trust for actually what will come if they actually move towards more uh, what we would call European values, which is actually liberal values, and actually uh, build up a credible liberal society. So thank you very much. I will stop there. Oh, thank you thank you very much, Arne, for uh, not mincing words um, and uh, being, being very uh, direct uh, uh, on the point of, uh, of uh, uh, maybe uh, a lack of democratic culture uh, in the Western Balkan states, which, which we all have to, to face uh, collectively. Um, and in this sense, um, I would uh, hand over, uh, without further delay, to give time to, con uh, to, to our conversation and to Remzilani, who wants to, to delve a little bit more is what is driving Balkan societies and also looking as, uh, at especially the trust issue and maybe also um, looking on, on the question of uh, delayed integration, which actually Luisa Chiodi should have covered. Remzi. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this event. I, I believe that Rome is the right place to, to have such a debate. 
This year marks the start of the fourth decade of the post-communist transition, which has been dominated by two main narratives. The first narrative was narrative of the past, communist legacy, war legacies. And the second narrative was the narrative of the future, EU integration, EU perspective, Thessaloniki agenda. What has been missing I think is the narrative of the present, the narrative of today. Between past disputes and, and future, and the bright future, we forgot somehow the present. Last year, uh, in January, our good friend Ivan Krastev was writing an article on, on the Balkans, and we were talking on the phone, and I said to him, Ivan, I have a metaphor, and Ivan loves metaphors. He's the master of metaphors. And I said, the transition is over. We did not shift from dictatorship to democracy, but we shifted from repressive regimes to depressive regimes. Of course, a metaphor is a metaphor. I understand that. But what I prefer to call the fiction of transition needs to be analyzed and, and examined now. Actually, what I think is that the people in our countries, they don't feel anymore that they are living in transition, but they feel that they are living in what I call transitocracy. Let's make some mathematics. We have three, 30 years until now, and, and the best case, we will join you, and in theory, the transition is over when you join you. I am not sure, look Poland and Hungary, but anyway, let's keep this theory. It will be 45 years, the same period as communism. Half a century cannot be considered a passage, a bridge. I think it's somehow a system, the system of transitocracy. And most of what we consider the transitory features actually are becoming permanent feature, features. Weak institutions versus strong leaders, weak rule of law, corrupt judiciary, permanent political conflict, extreme polarization, and so on. What I see in, in our region are three crises, which in one hand cause, on the other hand reflect what I call depression. First is the crisis of trust. We are all low trust societies. Albania trusts 90% NATO, 94% EU, and only between 15 to 25 percent trust Albanian political parties or judiciary. Albanians trust the democratic system, but they don't trust institutions of the system. And we see a large, huge gap between political elites and the publics. Second is the crisis of choice. Tired and disappointed of 30 years of, of transition, a large segment of the society thinks that they are all the same. The lack of elite circulation strengthens this feeling. And for them, quoting, now quoting me, Krastev, the choice looks like between Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola when they go in the elections. Young people tweet, but they don't vote. And the third crisis is the crisis of hope. Maybe Albania has been changing enough fast for me, but it's clear that it's not changing fast enough for the gener generation of my daughter. And here is the gap. People are simply living. The demo demo demographic decline is serious. And in this context, I see that in the Western circles, in the Western media, there are fears of explosion in the Balkans. I, I am not sure. What I fear is the implosion of the, 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 the fabric of the society and the model of governance in, in our countries. Here, now, the, 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 the crisis of trust, hope, and, and choice has to be put in the, in the context of what has to be and is supposed to be the main transformation driver, new integration. Early in 2000, in 2004, Amato Commission, Ivan, Pevoda and myself, we have been involved somehow, concluded the cost of, of, of isolation of the region are much higher than the cost of integration. 
I believe this is still relevant. But actually, what we saw last 15 years was not an isolation, has been what we can be called delay, or I call it somehow a mixture of enlargement policy with containment policy. And, you know, our leaders were coming to Rome and going back home happy, enlargement policy, and going to Paris and coming back home unhappy, containment policy. Somehow contained enlargement, delayed enlargement. I think it's time now for sincerity and clarity. Constructive ambiguity is not constructive anymore. Uh, we have been working very much on the assumptions that the, the EU integration, as it was, as we've seen until now, will be an agent of change. Yes, but not always. It could be an also agent of the status quo, as it happened recently. I have a question to put. How happened that all Balkan countries during the last five years are closer to the Brussels in their formal relationship with the EU, and they are all less democratic? Or most of them are less democratic? and oscillate between stagnation and decline. There are, since we are talking from the driving forces, there are two driving forces which we cannot ignore. One is populism, which is popular also in the Balkans. And second is new nationalism, which is actually very European. It's not the old Balkan type of nationalism. It's very much central European type of nation, nationalism. My colleague from Sarajevo, Srećko Latal, in an in a excellent paper he, he wrote recently, has been talking on a new methodology, on the reset, on the redynamizing the system after the, the March decision, which is a great moment. And, and uh, Srećko actually proposed splitting the process in two. On the immediate process, which means investment, infrastructure, job creation, uh, green economy, and in the long-term process, which is the rule of law. Somehow this is a, a proposal which reconciles the future, the today with the future. I have a word also on geopolitics. Since the first panel, uh, it was a talk on geopolitics. Pierre, Michel, Pierre, Pierre Mirel, in a paper recently, said that Balkans is an exclusive geopolitical zone for a geopolitical commission, as Van der Leyen said. True. Uh, comparing with before, uh, the, the, the commission is much more geopolitical. It's not only the key communitaire driven approach, not only technocratical approach, sticking uh, chapters. It's more geopolitical. And there is a battle of narratives as uh, Josep Borrell said, but it's also a, a battle of access, as we see, have seen during the pandemics, and it was mentioned also here. But EU geostrategy seems, in my opinion, to be driven more by Russian, Chinese, Turkish fears, rather than by uh, its clearly defined interests. Europe has to see Balkans based on its interests, not based on the fact that they want to stop the third actors, which I think is good, eh? but Trump. it's more. Yeah, I will finish. And second point is that uh, Russia, Turkey, Arab countries, uh, China, they all can afford losing in the Balkans, but I don't think that uh, Europe has this luxury, losing its, in its territory. Even the United States can afford losing in the Balkans, but not, uh, not Europe. And uh, and geopolitics became now much more complex. It used to be easy, West versus the rest. Albania has to care West versus the rest, and we are pro-Western. Now it's Europe. You are somehow between Europe and the United States. They are not at the same page on everything. And somehow you are also now between different member, NATO member states who play different games, or they have different Interest. Albania can be found itself between Greece and Turkey, for example, now. 
So it's not the old geopolitics. It's a very much a new and, and more complex geopolitics, which is also another driver which we can we have to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ramsey. We will pick up a couple of, uh, uh, of issues that in the discussion, uh, especially I would then follow uh, up on your fear of the implosion of societies. Uh, but before going there, um, I want to give the floor to Valbona, um, who wants to talk about or was tasked to talk about the economic challenges of the region. So Valbona, the floor is yours. I'm so glad, can you hear me? Okay, I'm very glad to be here. I'd like to thank you for the invitation, Ambassador Minuto uh, Rizzo. Um, I would like to say from the very beginning that I'm speaking in my personal capacity. I'm not uh, representing the Marshall Center or the US and, or German governments. Um, what I wanted to say, there was a question that was uh, raised uh, during the first panel, which I thought it was a great panel. Uh, what is the role of Italy? I think Italy has been one of the most important players for the Euro-Atlantic integration of the Balkans. It has been an ally, it has been an advocate of the region, and it has invested also a lot over the last, let's say, 30 years. And I'm a living example, I would say, of that kind of investment. So I was uh, the first generation of students that came to study in Italy at a scholarship of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, so I'm forever grateful. And I think investment in human capital, in capacity building, it's much more important even than investment in infrastructure. So let me uh, you know, bring a couple of points when it comes to challenges to um, economic development and integration in the region. I think that economic security is the main security challenge of the Western Balkans. Um, so it stems from a never-ending transition process that it was brought up from uh, Mr. Lani to through a toxic combination of poverty, weak rule of law, and corruption. And so what we have seen over the last few years has been a convergence with the West, which was the hope at the very beginning, that has stalled. Right now, um, the income per capita, the average income per capita in the region is only 13% of the income per capita of the European Union. And it has been such for a very long time. So although we have had increases, when it comes to catching up with the West, that was the term that was used when everybody was optimistic about the European future of the region. I think it's, it's being, uh, has stalled. And so according to different uh, studies, it will take the region between 70 and 100 years to catch up with the, uh, the level, level of living uh, in, the, in the Western European countries. And we should not forget the COVID recession that will hit the region really hard. And the two previous recessions, in 2008-9, although the region was not part of the financial system, it suffered the spillover consequences of the, of the crisis in Europe. And also, there was another crisis in 2012 with other recessions in the region. So throughout the last 12 years since the financial crisis, we have had seen the stalling of the economic development of the region. And unfortunately, numbers do not lie. So this is the reality there. Uh, my second point will be regarding the brain drain. And this is caused, actually, from what we're seeing in terms of economic insecurity in the region. Uh, and I think what motivates people to leave the region, to leave their own countries, is economic and institutional gap with the West. So it's not only about economic reasons. It's about governance reasons that pushes people also out from their home countries. Uh, for a very long time, immigration has been seen as an opportunity in the region. Uh, even now that we're speaking 30 years after the opening of the region, remittances make up more than 10% of the GDP of the region. So of course, it was money that came in the countries to uh, fuel consumption, but also most importantly, I would say, it was also used as a social valve in the region to keep stability uh, somehow. Uh, 
In my opinion, uh, what we're seeing with this massive immigration from the region, I think it exacerbates the acute shortage of skilled workers. So we should not look at that as an opportunity, but actually that might turn into a security challenge in the future. And that has to do with the fact that we have an unstructured circular, circular migration. So we're not having people, you know, having re-exported them in the region with knowledge and education. Uh, it happens somehow in some countries, but it's not structured. The third point has to do with the challenges that hamper economic growth rates in the Balkans. Poor functioning institutions, all those were brought also in the first panel. Informal economies, uh, low productivity, but also lack of regional integration. And I think that has been one of the main challenges for future economic development in the region. And there is this idea that the fear of regional integration, that you know, you're being left back from European Union or, or that. I'm you know, one of those people that believes that you have to go through that step in order to be prepared for economic integration, but also furthermore for globalization. Right now, countries are too weak uh, in order to compete on their own uh, in the European market or in the global market. Just an example, the region attracts 0.23%, I'm bringing the number on purpose, it's not you know, uh, important to remember that, but 0.23% of the global stock of foreign direct investment. Considering that European Union is the biggest investor in the global economy with almost 50% of the investment. Uh, fourth point has to do with great power competition in China. It was also discussed in the first panel. I'd like to see that from the economic perspective, but also economic uh, security perspective. I think that Beijing is using easy money and soft power to gain very quickly influence in the region. And we're not seeing that only in Serbia, Valerie spoke about that, but throughout the region. Um, and it's using the appeal of um, economic miracle maker. And somehow people are buying in, into that, into that uh, rhetoric. Um, of course, China views the Balkans as a gateway commercial platform to Western Europe, but I think that Balkans are really very low hanging fruit for China, for their interest, for their uh, investments, but also geopolitical uh, interests. Uh, Beijing, of course, right now is taking advantage of poor um, infrastructure, the infrastructure gap with Western Europe, uh, loose regulations, uh, lax public procurement rules, poor labor regulations, but above all, lack of transparency. That is what is pushing all these new deals, uh, lack of transparency and accountability, and lack of you know, public discourse, public you know, uh, speaking about those, uh, those uh, uh, deals. Of course, the European Union remains the main trading partner for the region, 72% of the total trade. And you see that there are more exports, so the region is more exporting towards the European Union than importing. When it comes to China, it's the second <coughs> trading partner for the region, well, almost 6%. However, trade is very, very heavily tilted in favor of China. So it's mainly Chinese exports in the region. When it comes to investment, right now, Chinese investment make up 20% of foreign direct investment in the region. It's not real investment at the end of the day. It's mainly loans. 80% uh, of them is loans, which creates more than security and governance uh, challenges in the region. So I see, when I look at China, I'm not saying that we should not, you know, the region does not need Chinese investment and or, you know, from other countries. Um, what I'm concerned about is the reduction of the standards uh, in terms of doing business. Uh, debt traps in some countries and how that might affect in the long term uh, uh, EU integration. And then my last point, I'll close here, is regarding what can be some opportunities in the future. I think you know, the opportunity of uh, positive integration with the EU uh, cannot be missed, but of course has to be earned. So right now, I think we have a moment that uh, as a result of COVID-19, as a result of you know, uh, maybe revised production and transportation networks uh, in Europe, 
I think the region has the chance to be considered a destination to recalibrate uh, the EU supply chains. But it has to be considered as a region, not you know, singular countries. And of course, EU integration will take a lot of long time. And the West needs an interim strategy for the region, which has to be based on economic uh, and social development. And not, when I say the West, it's not just the European Union, it's the transatlantic response to the region. That concludes my Thank thoughts. You. Thank you very much um, for that. Yeah. Thank you also uh, mentioning the, the brain drain, immigration, which in the end, uh, with a, if you look at the pro projections, um, will lead almost to a depopulation of, of uh, big areas, not only the Western Balkans, but if I take also Southeast Europe altogether. Um, that makes the bridge uh, to our, our last but not least uh, speaker here, Lubov Ivanov, who is uh, giving us a Bulgarian angle on the region. Lubov. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I want to join those that uh, thanked uh, Ambassador Alessandro Minuturizzo for convening this uh, uh, conference, and I think that this is a clear indication uh, in support of my first uh, argument, which is about the strategic importance of the region. It goes without saying at the first glance, but in fact it's not so simple. And uh, if we look at the agenda from Thessaloniki in 2003, at that time it seemed that uh, it's going to be uh, always high on the agenda, the integration path, but uh, we all know, we call it sometimes the integration fatigue or with other terms, but in fact uh, it started uh, going through ups and downs. Fortunately, Bulgaria was uh, among those that uh, joined uh, in a reasonable time frame, both NATO and the EU. But then there, was, uh, there were delays, and uh, it's not always only the fault of uh, the preparation of the candidate countries, but also the will and the focused approach, uh, also flexible enough uh, in relation to the changing uh, circumstances from the uh, NATO and EU member states. Um, it's uh, related, of course, to the positive transformation power of the integration processes, and this is very important. Uh, we, uh, I remember when I was visiting as already a perm rep to NATO, some uh, countries from the Western Balkans, uh, the question number one was, what is our benefit from joining uh, NATO and the EU? Even about the EU, there were some, some second thoughts. And I was giving an example which is absolutely true. In 2002, when we received an invitation in, in Prague to, to join NATO, then we had a jump in foreign direct invent, investment about twofold, which was a clear uh, result of the increased trust in our credibility. But that, this was a time of uh, booming economy throughout the world. And uh, our own growth was about six, six and a half percent. And this is not the case anymore, unfortunately. And uh, uh, such an effect uh, cannot be uh, guaranteed now. So we have to really think, and I agree with uh, the need for a more, more focused approach, to really keep the influence, the impact, and the positive attitude to, to the integration process in, uh, in those countries that are still uh, pending in this respect. Uh, uh, that's why we, when, uh, when we were in the presidency of the EU Council in 2018, uh, made as our own fo uh, main focus uh, the uh, impulse in support of the Thessaloniki agenda, and partially we succeeded. <coughs> there was a follow-up follow to the results of the SOFIA summit uh, in 2018 in Zagreb, uh, but I would stress that uh, events we couldn't foresee, like the COVID-19 crisis, is something that is not helping. And we need to, to think how to, to react also to that from the viewpoint of the uh, attractiveness of uh, uh, the integration path. Uh, but I'll come later when, we, when I mention, about the, uh, mention the Berlin 
process where we are in the chair together with the Republic of North Macedonia. And uh, uh, I would stress that uh, uh, the reforms should continue in the Western, Western Balkans. And it's very important uh, because there is, it is a double-edged sword, I would say. First, uh, many countries think that the delay is uh, pointing in the direction that it's uh, slowing down for such a long period of time that whatever the uh, result of the reforms in these countries, uh, they will be uh, invited and be integrated into both the uh, European Union. For NATO, it's, uh, as we know, somewhat easier, but it's also uh, important to keep the bar high. high. It's not going to, uh, to, be, to, to have a positive effect if we lower the bar and uh, lower the uh, requirements, the uh, reform agenda that needs to be met. Of course, say, having said that, uh, NATO and the EU should also uh, stick to their guns and uh, fulfill um, and do their part of the road because it's not only the, uh, the effort of the candidate countries. Uh, this is very important also in terms of uh, the need to not introduce, uh, when joining, uh, unsolved bilateral problems between the countries, members and non-members. And uh, this is good neighborliness. Uh, we know that uh, uh, keeping our, mind, uh, our eyes shut about that uh, is counterproductive. And uh, this should be uh, kept high on the agenda, not only just uh, being uh, uh, paid lip service, if you want. The same about uh, international law, international obligations, including bilateral treaties. Uh, this is uh, a simple interpretation or extrapolation of the Pacta Sunt Servanta. And this uh, should be quite clear also for countries that maybe consider that, that this is not a must. Uh, next, just a couple of words about the destabilizing, destabilizing influence of uh, third states uh, whose values are quite different from ours. I think that it's uh, of course, it's a very serious uh, problem uh, with the Russian influence, but uh, their instrumentarium is uh, first somewhat limited. They tend to overestimate their own uh, capacity, if you want. And then uh, both in military terms, and also uh, they are not uh, a match to, to NATO, of course. And uh, uh, in terms of energy security, uh, I think that uh, progress has been made and is being made, and uh, this is, uh, an instrument with a diminishing uh, power, let's say. For China, it's more, more, much more complicated because they are trying to beat us on our own turf in terms of competitiveness and, uh, uh, if you want, market mechanisms. Let's not forget, as a sinologist, I would uh, uh, remind you that in 2008, uh, they didn't do bailouts, uh, the West did. And uh, this is something that uh, is increasing the problem for us uh, because this is uh, making their economy more competitive. Uh, so this really requires a very in-depth analysis and uh, uh, a very a much more comprehensive strategy. And it does not uh, work only through uh, unity and through, if you want, political assessments, but also it's rather basic in terms of uh, the way in which our finance, uh, financial and economic mechanisms work. Um, as, uh, I don't know where I'm exactly in terms of uh, minutes, okay, but uh, uh, we, uh, we follow closely the, uh, how things are developing uh, between Belgrade and Pristina. We are very optimistic in terms of uh, the last results uh, which were mentioned uh, during the interview in, uh, reached in Washington, but still uh, there are risks. Finally, as a final point, I want to uh, stress the 
uh, current presidency, which was mentioned. In November, we are going to have a summit of the Berlin process in Sofia. And exactly, uh, the tangible results are the focus of our uh, uh, efforts, including so that they are visible and they are felt in the region, including uh, the idea for a, a regional economic zone, uh, also an action plan to, for integration of the Roma populations, uh, a system of uh, possibility to uh, open the borders uh, in terms of uh, access for with ID cards, things that are going to revitalize, we hope, and give an impetus to the uh, uh, economic uh, development. And uh, I think all that I said is an answer to one comment made in the first session about uh, uh, Bulgaria's so-called attempt to block the integration process of the Republic of North Macedonia. Uh, I think that uh, all these efforts that I mentioned absolutely do not uh, do not allow such an assessment. But we want to to be clear that uh, we want the treaties to be observed, and uh, otherwise uh, we are. The, the, let's say, most active proponents of, uh, of the integration, including of the Republic of North Macedonia, which was uh, underscored also by the agreement that was reached between, between us and them before the PRESPA agreement. So uh, I think that uh, what was uh, made as a comment was absolutely unfounded. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lubomir. I will take the prerogative now as uh, the chair to pose a first question to all. Um, um, panelists, and I will start with Arne. Um, you mentioned words like uh, clientelism, nationalism, populism, law and order rather than the rule of law. So my question to you is, uh, what is different to many a EU member state in, in this respect? Um, what uh, have we to teach if we cannot get our house in order? And the second uh, also provocative question, because you were so frank, is uh, the intertwining of autocratic uh, um, government with organized crime and corruption, which is often um, associated with, with the Western Balkans. Arne. I think there are lots of similarities between some EU countries, or actually all EU countries, and the Western Balkans. It's actually similarities in many ways are actually more important than the differences. But at the same time, we tend to have very um, how shall I put it? We have uh, demands, uh, which are sometimes not based on facts, but more on ideals. And I think we have to deal with the, the region actually based on our own experience. As I think I mentioned, you know, it's, um, in, you know, EU is struggling with some EU member states where actually there are discussions about whether or not they, they respect the rule of law. And, uh, you know, the societies we talk about in the Western Balkans, they are more similar with these than they are with, um, with the countries like Sweden and Norway, and we have to actually, um, th th this is a matter of fact, you know, we have to be street smart when we deal with the, uh, the region. Uh, we have to try to harness uh, the demands of society for actually a fair society uh, in favor of democratic values. But at the same time, we cannot actually um, relate to the region as uh, just based on theory. You know, we have to actually, th th there are actually big challenges. They will not move from uh, to the uh, ideal of the European Union uh, values in uh, in three years or in five years or in ten years. You know, it takes time. And uh, But we have to play, actually, we, we have to deal with the elites. Uh, we have to be uh, demanding, but we also have to be street smart. Uh, and I think the, the most, um, the best instrument we possibly have is actually uh, the carrots which EU membership represents. I actually do think that actually uh, the elites in the region also want to join the European Union. You know, it's, they actually want it. Uh, so that's actually the carrots. I'm not sure what kind of uh, stick we have. Uh, in a certain uh, sense, you can say that if the um, belief in EU membership is big enough and if they feel it's uh, close enough, and uh, they can achieve it. Uh, this carrot is so big, so it can actually uh, work as a kind of a stick as well. You either have to do X or you will not become members, but we're not there. 
so in the meantime, it, we have to behave in a kind of a street smart way towards the region. We have to accept that there are, you know, no state are perfect. No public opinion is actually free from uh, populistic or nationalistic instincts. But we have to accept it as a fact and work with this rather than actually um, live in a kind of a ideal universe because it doesn't exist. I'm not sure if I was very clear, but my point is just to do basically take three points. You know, we have to harness societal change in favor of democratic values. But we have to accept at the same time that we are actually um, we are actually dealing with societies which are very, you know, conservative is a nice expression, but they're actually uh, backward looking and uh, very preoccupied by um, identity issues and historical wrongs. Uh, we have to be demanding, but smart when dealing with elites, and we have to make EU membership uh, credible carrots. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, then I'll go over to, to Ramsey. Um, although you promised, you haven't touched so much on the role of the media, um, and uh, especially um, many of the Western Balkan countries, we, have, we see a decrease in media pluralism, um, which is an important checks and balances for, for democratic uh, development. But we heard also from Rio Rizzo today, media literacy, um, how do we deal with, uh, with media? And then I would like to, you to uh, elaborate a little bit on this implosion of society. Is that, has that to do that, uh, that uh, the Wealth and Balkan societies are uh, less inclusive, uh, more uh, unequal than, than e EU uh, societies? Can you, uh, uh, less cohesion in the societies, can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, I will be very brief. Uh, on media, one of the reasons why, as I said, we are closer to the Brussels, but countries score uh, worse than before on Freedom House, on Reporters Our Frontier, on Bertelsmann Transformation Index, on many indexes uh, compared with before, media is one of them. And there is a shrinking space for, for media freedom. Uh, what we see is an anti-media rhetoric and anti-media laws in the region. We see actually a lot of hate speech in one hand, nothing new in the Balkans, but also a lot of what I call fake speech, where I put disinformation, conspiracy theories, propaganda, and we have seen a lot of them during the pandemics, coming not only from the third countries, but coming also from radical groups in the West. We see the paradox that uh, digitalization brought more channels, and we have more channels and less pluralism because of the ownership control by a small group of media tycoons. And we see also cyber attacks and, uh, and a lot of uh, troll farms also in the region against uh, uh, government critiques, against uh, politicians, against uh, uh, human rights activists and so on. The problem is that if you go and, and look on media literacy index, all Balkan countries are in the last 10, actually including neighbors, Hungary and, and so on, which means we are very much vulnerable towards fake news, towards propaganda, and this is a challenge that none of our societies has been addressing seriously. On the second question, uh, you know, I think the challenge in our country when it comes to to avoid implosion, what I call implosion, is that we have to talk not only for the stability, not only for the democracy, not only for their relationship, but also for normality. People want to live in normal countries, you know. And you can be the only normalizer of our societies, I think, the only one. What we have seen during the last third decades and we are all somehow guilty, is that our debates, our discourse have been very much on democracy and not much on capitalism. 
rightly we've been talking for the for the for for the democrat fragility of for our fragile democracies but we have been been talking much for our predatory wild capitalism and actually today it's time to talk not only for the elected leaders but also for the elected oligarchs because they are dictating to the politicians and to to us so I, I think it's it's a it's a moment of of that we need to 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 see the nature of our capitalism because I'm afraid I might be wrong might sound controversial that our quality of our democracy is a better than the quality of, of our capitalism with all inequalities with all with the level of poverty with the the the, all the gaps and, inco and, and lack of cohesion we see in our society, and I, I'm not a sociologist, I am a journalist, but uh, I think this is a serious challenge to address the nature of our capitalism. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Val <laughs> uh, Valbona, you were talking about the need for regional integration, also the first panel uh, was, was mentioned, the so-called mini Schengen. Um, I mean, the idea of, of sort of a, a prep uh, before coming EU member of a regional integration not new, the SEFTA, um, then even the, the, the last before the last uh, um, reform of, of the accession process was to uh, focus more on the economic preparation of EU uh, candidates uh, after Croatia, where, where there was not a focus on that. Um, so um, is this feasible, I mean, is Schengen? Is it feasible without normalization between Kosovo and Serbia um, to have the four freedoms as uh, envisaged in the EU? You know, I, I don't know if, you know, calling it mini Schengen or some other, you know, uh, uh, name, um, I don't know how that sounds in the region. Uh, maybe that does not send the mini Schengen, might not send the right message. You know, we don't want to be mini, so we have the, this, you know, grandiosity in the region. We're big, so why should we be mini Schengen? We are part of, of the European Union. So it's a precondition, and it has not just been the case with SEFTA or other, you know, EU strategies. It has been from the very beginning with Stability Pact. The idea was that through economic integration, you can bring reconciliation in the region. And we have already seen examples in Europe right after World War II that this is how it has worked. So I'm a strong believer that only through reduction of trade uh, of barriers, uh, tariff and non-tariff, those are the most important. This is how you get people you know, to work with each other, to uh, talk to each other, and understand that it is for the common good that the region needs to be economically integrated. So I'm, I'm a strong believer in economic integration of the region. Uh, but if I may also jump in on the question that you asked to, uh, to Ramzi regarding, I fully agree with him regarding the free market economy, and that's why I said from the very beginning, economic security is the main challenge. I don't think that you know, we have had a real free market competitive economy in the region. And that is the problem for all what we see today, nowadays, for the corruption, for transnational organized crime, and, and all sorts of challenges. I think we have seen more of a rent-seeking economy in the region with you know, monopolies and all that that have not allowed development uh, uh, in, these, in these countries. So I think it's the right approach for the EU to focus more on economic development. And I'm very glad that the EU Commission is a geopolitical one. I think we needed it also for the Western Balkans. I think that all the EU enlargement process had turned too technical. And I think it is a security issue having the Balkans part of the European Union. So, uh, but I also think the European Union needs to be more direct in talking to these countries, should not create ambiguity about the future of the Balkans, but also about the standards and how they're doing into this EU integration process. Thank you very much. I have now the pleasure to open up the, the, the floor uh, for questions and answers. Like in the first panel, there are two microphones standing left and right for you to uh, pose your questions from. I see the gentleman here in front. 
Maurizio Geri from Eurogulf Information Center. My question is about the demographic decline and the brain drain in the Balkans. That is not so different from Italian situation. So I wanted to ask what is the feeling of the new generation, the youth, the people that have not been leaving the Yugoslavian disintegration, and uh, if they feel the European identity or not, because I think this is very important. We have been talking about social capital, human capital, so my question is about the new generation of the Balkans. Thank you. Thank you. I would propose that we take uh, a few questions and then we ask the, the, the panelists. I didn't see that you, you directed to a certain uh, of the panelists, so I, I will just go get it around. Please, the je next gentleman, please. Uh, I'm Sam Hardy at the University of Oslo's uh, Norwegian uh, Institute in Rome. Uh, journalists at Scoop in North Macedonia have talked about the way that politicians and politically exposed persons have expensive paintings but inexpensive cars, obviously because the public can see the cars and not the paintings. And uh, the antiquities collecting of a politically exposed person in Bulgaria, Vasil Bozhkov, highlights the way that um, this can be important for reputation laundering as well as money laundering. And I was just wondering whether the, the panel think that or expect to see effective action against this kind of activity to counter corruption and strengthen the rule of law. Thank you very much. Is there a third question? Gentleman in the back. Good afternoon. My name is Vincenzo Danna. I'm an officer of the Italian Army interested in communi communication. So my question is to Mr. Ramsilani. Uh, you before answered to my, my question about uh, the social media and uh, as I can understand the narrative uh, about populism and nationalism is almost the same uh, like in Europe. But my second question was uh, which is uh, the main actor, external actor, supporting the narrative that you mentioned before? Thank you. Thank you very much. I would suggest that uh, since in, we have uh, only limited time, that you pick up the three questions and also then maybe integrate it into uh, your, your statement, uh, a last statement, because I think we're, we're running out of time here. So can we start again uh, with you, Arne, in Oslo? Do you want to answer one of these three questions? Uh, but else, just uh, your, your general um, closing remarks. I'll try to be very, very quick. Uh, when it comes to the uh, young generation, polls show that there is no big difference uh, between the, uh, those actually who remember actually Yugoslavia and those who do not. In a certain sense, there are actually polls that show that actually the young generation is actually possibly even more nationalistic, uh, has more unrealistic image of what Yugoslavia was, at least in certain countries, so than actually the, the elder one who actually lived through it. So I don't think we can say, we can actually um, expect big change to happen because actually of a new generation growing up. And it's also actually a matter of uh, actually information. You know, they they do rely on information they get at school and from the um, from social media. And uh, we are not good enough in actually giving a good narrative. And I think that's actually what we what we need have a good narrative about what they can actually achieve by actually making the countries more democratic, more liberal, and actually moving towards, uh, you know, membership of the European Union. Um, when it comes to fighting against corruption, I think, you know, the current leadership in these countries have, have should put it, they, their main priority is not fighting against their own actually uh, ways of uh, using the system. And unfortunately, the opposition is sometimes have the same mentality because they will actually sometimes have the same opportunities when they, if they ever get into power. And sometimes they have been in power before and actually have benefited from it. So I think the most realistic approach would probably to be focused more on prevention and actually getting in place good system based on EU regulations, EU standards, and actually trying to go after those who actually have done something wrong previously. Thanks. Thank you very much, Arne. Um, Remzi, a direct question to you, but yeah. generally. The times of uh, the enthusiasm for Facebook and Twitter revolutions is over. Now more and more you see headlines, social media threat for democracy. I am I'm sure that a lot of you saw the social dilemma. 
the, the recent movie on the role of social media. It's complex. And we have seen it during the pandemics, to cut it short, that we saw what, uh, what uh, was called infodemia. So we had the pandemia and we had the infodemia. The sources. Uh, there is a lot of domestic product. You know, in the Balkans, there are a lot of fake news factories which work, uh, which work, work quite well, I, if I can be ironical, cynical. But there, there are also, as there also in a report of, uh, of European Commission has mentioned in April, there is a lot of disinformation coming from third actors, namely mentioned in Russia and China. But also I will add Turkey and Iran. They are all very, they have their own agendas and they, they, they are very active in, in, in social media spreading their, their narratives, which are not always compatible with our narratives also. But not to forget, there are also radical groups, radical conspiracy groups in the West. So it's a very, very, uh, com very complex picture, I think. And addressing it, it's not, it's not uh, easy. I don't think that there is any magic formula. Uh, uh, I come back again to what Jan mentioned, to the media information literacy, investing on that, that people will be educated and able to deduct what's truth and what's not the truth. Thank you very much. Valbona? Uh, I think I'm going to take the question that uh, was uh, directed to the drain, uh, brain drain from the Balkans. We live in a globalized world, and of course, we cannot stop people from moving from their own countries and choosing their life in other countries. So that's not the right approach. The governments, thank God, you know, we don't exist. We are not in communism anymore. That you know, have to have uh, exit visas from your countries. But this, in this, you know, the whole thing, not only regarding the Balkans but more globally, is a is a qu equation of push and pull factors. And of course, the European Union countries have a strong pull factor. Uh, even though we're speaking about the influence of other third actors in the region, young people from the region, they want to come to Rome, they want to go to Paris, Berlin, United States. They're not going to China or Russia or other countries. So this power of attraction of the democracies, Western democracies, uh, remains, remains very strong. I think what the countries need to be, do better is to reduce the push factors, things that push people away from their own countries. As I mentioned, this is because of economic and institutional despair, and that's why people leave. So you'll always have the economic you know, migrants everywhere, but it's important that you should have, not have those institutional migrants that are leaving the countries because they don't trust the institutions anymore. This is, I think, where the governments need to do a better job. And then the very first question that we need to ask when we talk about EU integration of the region is that, what does EU mean for people in the Western Balkans? And actually that question was asked. Uh, it means well-being, it means freedom to travel, it means freedom to be educated in other countries. So this is what they think of when they think about the EU integration process. Uh, I wrote in a paper a couple of years ago that when the EU is still skeptical and the, all the EU, you know, uh, enlargement freezing and all that, if the EU is not going to the Western Balkans, young people from the Western Balkans will go to the EU, will find the way, and still, you know, live under those, uh, uh, you know, conditions and standards. So that's why we need to see that more from a geopolitical perspective. I think the the future of the Western Balkans in the EU, the question of that, is a question for the European Union itself, about the future of the European Union. You have these discussions also in Italy and elsewhere. So what is the EU for? Is it an commu economic community only? Or is it a community of you know, Western uh, values and standards? So that is what should be put, I think, as a key question in the EU integration process. Thank you, Valbona. Um, I have to apologize. I didn't 
include you in my uh, uh, series. Maybe you're grateful because my question would have been, are you in favor that uh, unanimity is abolished in the EU accession process so that one member state cannot block uh, alone, cannot can block uh, another country? Um, but you don't have to answer that one since, since, since I didn't ask it in the previous round. But uh, please, do you want to answer whether the questions or answer, make it? A... I'll answer directly. Uh, yeah. I don't think that this should be the case because it can backfire in a very negative way for the future. Because uh, sometimes uh, not all uh, members of the EU or NATO are well aware of uh, the specific situations. I remember 2008, uh, the Bucharest summit, when uh, a very well-known figure from a strong country when uh, it was discussed who to invite, who, who, who would not uh, be appropriate to invite, said, I don't understand fully the, the, the problem, but I know that solidarity is a key principle in the alliance, and I think this continues to be valid. On the other hand, uh, what, what was mentioned about brain drain and demo demography, I think that I need to answer that because we are among uh, the countries we, which suffered worse from that especially highly qualified uh, people like uh, doctors and nurses and so on. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, there is uh, some, in, let's say, some positive change from IT sector, which is more flexible. And this is what keeps our young people, or a large share of them, in Sofia. But if you're a doctor and you're getting a salary which is uh, five times lower than in, even in Ireland, let's say, I'm not speaking about the highest standards, like Luxembourg, for instance, then it's difficult to uh, resolve or to really do the lowering of the push factor on your own. And that's why I think that the cohesion policies of the EU uh, should be more, uh, let's say, aggressive in the positive way and more focused because so far I think uh, mm, the resources devoted to that are delivering less than what they could deliver. And the corruption, I think we have uh, good progress because some of the, let's say, best known oligarchs are now under the serious pressure from the law. Uh, but uh, the result is, uh, does, it doesn't pay back in, in months, but longer. But still, I think the, the prospect is very, quite positive. Thank, thank you very much. I want to thank all panelists uh, for their contribution, Arne uh, virtually uh, from, from Oslo. I think it was a very rich uh, discussion, um, showing that uh, we have uh, a lot of challenges ahead, uh, but the challenges uh, need not be um, unique uh, um, to the Western Balkans, uh, but we have to, 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 to tackle them uh, head on. And I would like to thank all the panelists for being so frank and direct in, in, in uh, naming the issues uh, and not mincing words. So thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody, uh, virtually and in person here to being part of this discussion.
Dimmi tu quando l'hai aperto. Pronto? No, ancora no. Adesso. No, sì. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like now to, to welcome and to give the floor to General Risi, who is speaking to us from Pristina. He is the commandant of the ongoing NATO operation, K4, in Pristina, under uh, Italian leadership since a few years. And I, um, think I welcome him, and I would like really to hear his comment. Generale, siamo molto felici di sentirla. A lei la parola. Uh, thank you for the welcoming uh, words. Right Honorable Fassino, Ambassador Kickert, Ambassador Minuto Rizzo, distinguished participants, good afternoon from Pristina. I am uh, Major General Michele Risi, I'm the current commander of K4. First of all, let me thank Ambassador Minuto Rizzo for this invitation and for your attention to K4 mission and the uh, its role in the Western Balkans. Before getting to the core tasks of the military mission, I would like to frame the context of the operation by very briefly tracing its history from its genesis to today. On 12 June 1999, following the Kumanovo military technical agreement that sanctioned the end of the 78 days of NATO intervention and putting an end to the massacre, K4 entered Kosovo. By deploying 50,000 soldiers, NATO worked to monitor the withdrawal of Serbian forces and stabilize the area. Endorsed by Resolution 1244 of the United Nations Security Council, K4 carried out with effectiveness and impartiality the plans of the Atlantic Council. First of all, Incursions and threats by the Belgrade forces were avoided, and together with the UN police, order and security were preserved. It started the demilitarization of the Kosovo Liberation Army guerrillas. Assistance was provided for the return of refugees and displaced persons from North Macedonia, as well as for the demining of 23,000 landmines and 7,500 unexploded weapons and the safety of historical and artistic heritage, including 26 monasteries and many churches. It supported the creation of civil institutions in close coordination with other international partners. Following the 2008 unilateral declaration of independence, K4, both because its presence derives from Resolution 1244, and that four NATO members do not recognize Kosovo, has maintained what we refer to as neutral status. In other words, we do not take a position on Kosovo sovereignty. As a result, our modus operandi vis-a-vis -vis with the Kosovo institutions and the non-recognizers can be challenging considering that among the non-recognizers, Greece, Romania, and Slovakia are troop contributing nations, and Spain is not. Over the years, international partners, UN, OECE, and the European Union have reduced their presence and competencies, relinquishing many of the, insti to the, to the institutions in Kosovo. CAFOR, while also duly registering a contraction of its military force, at current around 3,500 soldiers from 26 na nations, including 18 members of NATO, has kept intact its role as the only security force unanimously recognized. But this can be explained by the fact that now we are complemented by the Kosovo police and the Kosovo security forces in assuring security and freedom of movement. Today, K4 has the mission of maintaining the security of Kosovo as third responder in order to facilitate the normalization of relations between Serbia and Kosovo. Since its establishment, K4 
has had to deal with a much compromised security situation. On one hand, there were the Albanian communities whose human rights were violated by the Belgrade regime. On the other are the Serbs and other minorities who suffered violent retaliation by the Albanian Kosovars. In this spiral of inter-ethnic hatred, KFOR has worked to protect the Kosovo Serbian communities, trying to dissuade the Albanians from their desire for revenge. Ending the violence, we assured the population and laid the foundation for Kosovo's future stability. Today, there are six security challenges in Kosovo. The first of which I've already introduced, the inter tensions, and then five other trials. These are primarily the shortcomings of the young Kosovo institutions, which certainly need to be strengthened. My 10 months of duty have been characterized by the first three with a caretaker cabinet of Ramusha Radinai, another two by the government of self-determination party of Albin Kurti, and then after a decision by the Constitutional Court by the government of Abdullah Oti, a coalition of various parties led by the Democratic League of Kosovo that obtained a majority by just one vote. Then, the long-standing diatribe between the monastic authority of the Chani and more generally the Serbian Orthodox Church with the Kosovo administration at various levels, which manifested itself in all its harshness, other in sheer violation of the rule of law. A case in point is the current issue of the Chane, in which we witness the persistent municipal opposition to proceed with the cadastral registration of 24 hectares adjacent to the monastery in execution of a sentence of the Constitutional Court or the attempt of a company appointed by the municipality to rebuild the road surface within the spatial protective zone without the consent of the Implementation Monitoring Council, which is composed by EU, OSCE, and Serbian Orthodox Church authorities. And the institutions in Kosovo, so in particular Ministry of Environment and the Spatial Planning. The event generated strong protests from the international community and the Quint ambassadors, as well as other organizations, strongly condemning the act that might have triggered an escalation in the security situation. It is worth noting that an apparently non-violent and local incident has produced a resonance that led President Vucic to ask for this topic to be included in the upcoming sessions of the dialogue, which was also mentioned in the document that was signed in Washington on September the 4th. As Conkey 4, I practically traveled back and forth to the monastery and with the help of my forces stationed in Patch, in the most severe days of crisis, mid-August, we avoided an escalation of tensions. The guarantee role of K4 was recognized not only by Bishop Theodosie and Dabot Sava, but by Prime Minister Hot himself, who instructed police to halt construction works on the road within the spatial protective zone. This event, unfortunately, has warned once more that corruption and in an illegal approach to common issues is part of the weakness of the young institutions. I see this as a factor that risks compromising the credibility of the local institutions, also on the international level, and which Serbia exploits in its narrative aimed at its discrediting Kosovo establishments. To this, we add the fourth factor, Wahhabi, religious fundamentalism, against which the authority of Pristina have started a very ambitious program of recovery and reintegration with the International Organization of Migration and the United States, especially in favor of foreign fighters returning from Syria and Iraq. Let me iterate that 387 foreign fighters left Kosovo from 2014 to 2018. 
The fifth factor is linked to Im immigration and is not to be a phenomenon that does not concern the Mediterranean region. Actually, one of the Balkan routes used by migrants passes through Kosovo, favoring the trafficking of human lives and other episodes of organized crime, illegal immigration, therefore is a further source of tension as Belgrade accuses Pristine authorities of not adequately tracking and tackling this issue. Last year in Kosovo, the number of registered migrants accounted to about 1,000 people, 1,200 people, of which about 250 were asylum seekers. Although numerically may not be alarming, arrivals have more than doubled compared to 2018. Last but not least, the request for indictment of war crimes against President Taci, the former president of the assembly and the current leader of PDK Kadri Veseli and other former combatants issued in June by the specialist chambers of the Hague. The reviewing judge has not yet deliberated on the case that remains Damocles sword on the old establishment still in prominent positions within the public administration. Likewise, last week, the same court executed the first arrests of three Kosovo Liberation Army veterans. In light of the security frameworks outlined above, we can better comprehend the great importance that the presence of K4 assumes in terms of deterrence. This first denies Serbia options for using conventional and non-conventional forces, which would find themselves getting in contact with K4 and therefore with NATO in the case of crossing the administrative boundary line to support any alleged attack to the Serbian communities in Kosovo. Secondly, it defines the external influence factors that risk destabilizing Kosovo and the Western Balkans. To understand this last statement and the strategic importance of Kosovo, we need to look at the small entity as the Gordian knot of the Balkans, not to be cut by unilateral acts, but to be carefully dissolved through the combination of deterrence and facilitated dialogue of international diplomacy. Besides the above mentioned situation, K4 security umbrella allows the perpetuation of the dialogue between Pristina and Belgrade facilitated by the EU. A process that as you well know is extremely complex and that can be negatively influenced by any disruption of the safe and secure environment and freedom of movement, the two milestones of K4 mandate. With the arrival of the Prime Minister Oti and the consequent removal of duties on, good, on goods at the end of June, the dialogue facilitated by the European Union resumed in Brussels under the supervision of the Special Envoy Miroslav Lajcak, both at high level, President Vucic and Prime Minister Oti, and at expert level. A very controversial point in the dialogue is that relating to the creation of the association of municipalities with a Serbian majority and above all, what functions executive powers will eventually be attributed to it. More than a, a few in the Kosovo Albanian contest warn about the risks of a Bosnianization of Kosovo, something that risks poisoning the seed of Kosovo state entity. Yet, of positive note, the 4th September agreement in Washington helped in creating momentum and building confidence between Belgrade and Pristina. The agreement is about 16 points in different areas that have certainly represented a step forward in the normalization of economic trade relations and stimulus to European Union action. We are doing our best to take steps forward 
and prevent Kosovo from becoming a frozen conflict. But the risk, needless to deny, exists. I am grateful to have had the opportunity to illustrate the status of our mission as the period ahead of us promises to be of particular interest. This concludes my briefing and of course I remain available to any question you might have. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for your comments, General. Thank you very much. Uh, have good work. Uh, now I would like to introduce, uh, for the concluding remarks, uh, the Honorable Piero Fassino. Uh, he is now the Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Chamber of the Italian Parliament, but he is much more than that, because he has a proven record of being a very distinguished politician and also, from my perspective, also somebody who has a keen interest in foreign affairs that he has uh, accomplished along all his life. I've been working with him directly when he was Under Secretary of State at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and there was Coordinator of European Affairs. And it, I don't know if I have to thank him or not, but it is because of him that I have traveled from Tallinn to Sofia to visit all the candidate countries to the European Union, but I think in the end it was a good work. Honorable Casino, you have the floor. Honorable Casino, prego. Thank you, Ambassador Torizzo, for this invitation. Thank you for the on honor of uh, having concluded this important conference. The well-documented in-depth remarks we have heard so far paint a picture of this significant portion of the Balkan Peninsula that uh, we call Western Balkans as a restless land yearning for recognition, stability, and a future. Six countries with uh, undeniable reciprocal bonds, overlapping tradition, ethnicities, languages, and religions. Each country has a summiting of its neighbors, but they are all individually unique. This distinctive originally does not lie in active purity, but rather in a plurality of population, languages, and religion, as shown by the fact that while the coexistence of different religions and ethnicities was ferociously attacked in 1990, and remain today an inexplicable fact and characteristic. In fact, multi-ethnic and multi-religious coexistence should be considered the genius logic of the Balkans. For this awareness to be widely shared, the region's neighbors have a role to play, assisting this country in strengthening integration and cooperation, but with one and other and wider international bodies that aim to promote their development, stability, and peace. The Balkan must be approached with great prudence. This prudence was lacking in the aftermath of the breakup of Yugoslavia, with the consequences we all know. We must learn from history instead of repeating its mistakes. We cannot afford to be superficial. And history tells us that this region has been characterized by strong ethnic identities but weak statehood. If we look back through the historical maps, 
we will only find the nation states in the Balkans in the last 100 to 150 years. Apart from the short lived experience of the Bulgarian and Serbian nation in the Middle Ages, the region moved almost seamlessly from the Roman on the Byzantine, Ottoman, Austro-Hungarian Empire, the last of which broke up just over 100 years ago. This history of nation and empire is what shaped the present day peninsula. A mosaic of ethnicity, religions, cultures, and alphabets, a frontier land between East and West, Europe and Asia, Christianity and Islam, Catholic and Orthodox churches. In this, is, it is this history that explains the return of a growing active presence of Russia and Turkey in the region. As if uh, harking back to 19th century geopolitics, when the small Balkan nation sought protection and security from one regional power or the other. This geopolitical setup will bring back ghosts and nightmares we want to banish forever. The Western Balkan, the entire Balkan, I would say, should instead be considered as a whole, carving them into sphere of influence as a, if we were back in the 19th century, will be a harbinger of constant instability. Geography, too, explained the Balkans' renewed strategic centrality. While in the 19th century, the centrality was born out of the dream of the Great Berlin to Baghdad Railways project, today the region is home of the other ambitious infrastructure projects. The pan-European mobility corridors promoted by the European Union, the new Silk Road linking China with Europe, whose land route runs through Istanbul and whose silk route runs through China's own port of Piraeus, Turkey's and Russia projects in the region we, uh, are also increasing. Without forgetting, the United States plays a role that uh, often is in, comp in competition with the European Union strategy for the Balkans. And the while considering the strategic importance of the Balkans, which arises out of the geographical position, we must not, forgot, not forget that while the physical border of the Western Balkans is the Adriatic Sea, its geopolitical border is the Eastern Mediterranean, the most bitterly fought over body of water of our time due to the discovery of huge deposit of natural gas. Heightened reason tension between Greece and Cyprus on one hand and the Turkey on the other cannot but resonate across the Balkans. One need only think of the historical and religious these ties between Serbia and Greece. These are the many reasons underscoring the strategic importance of integrating the Western Balkans into Euro-Atlantic institutions. This goal was indicated as, uh, early as, as early as the Dayton Accords as the way to overcome the many conflicts that have affected the region historically and to guarantee stability and the security for the Balkans and the continent as a whole. And while NATO has a speed up integration, the European process launched in Thessaloniki in 2003 has been far slower. This has caused frustration and disappointment in the Balkan public opinion and threatens to rehack national impulses and the nostalgia. For this reason, the launch of negotiation with Serbia and Montenegro and Albania and Macedo North Macedonia in the months to come is a positive development. And it is important that the negotiation can be accelerated, thus demonstrating the European Union won't really the entry of the Balkans into the European family. By the same token, normalize the relation between Serbia and Kosovo are desider desirable, together with a more cohesive Bosnia. These are both necessary conditions to boost prospect of integration in Pristina and Sarajevo. 
to put it simply, the strategic importance of the Western Balkans as five main drivers, all of which fall under the heading of security. The first concerns energy. The stability of the Western Balkans is essential in order to ensure a plurality of energy suppliers, which in turn is uh, crucial for the energy security of Europe. This includes both the issues of a gas pipeline and the threat of uh, extraction of natural gas from the Eastern Mediterranean, which could be liquefied in the ports of Adriatic and shipped all over Europe. The second driver concerns military security. Military security. Now that Montenegro and Armenia have joined NATO, the chances of other regional powers establishing military bases of the uh, Adriatic Sea and jeopardizing Europe's and Italy's security space have been averted. It must, however, be acknowledged that these new members require constant care and attention in political terms. History teaches teach us that in the Balkans nothing can be taken for granted, and more importantly, nothing is irreversible. The third driver concerns security against uh, threats of religious, religious terrorism. We know that in the recent past, in the Western Balks, Balkans, have seen instances of Islamic radicalization that have led to emergence of terrorist cells and the recruitment of Islamic State fighters. This region, which has lived through years of wars and tension, is becoming a hotbed uh, of rampant extremist and anti-Western organization unless it is adequately supported and accompanied by international organization in its process of, of rebirth. An additional and more recent strategic driver regard what they might call migratory security. In that the Balkan route has been one of the main route for refugees fleeing Middle Eastern wars in recent years, generating significant tensions. In the current geopolitical cl climate, migration can be used by regional powers to pressure neighboring countries with a view to destabilizing them. Given the weakness of their statute, as discussed earlier, the Western Balkans are particularly vulnerable as, uh, to such pressures. The final geopolitical and geostrategic challenges posed by the Western Balkans is the threat of democratic security. It reflects the fragility of, regi of regimes that are formally democratic, but tend to constrain the rule of law to become autocratic regime with little regard for political opposition and the independence of the media and judiciary power. Such an uh, outcome will not only jeopardize the open, thought, open for entry of the six counties in the Western Balkans into the Atlantic Alliance of the European Union, in that it will further destabilize Europe as a whole. Finally, I will touch upon Italy's role. With its history of credibility and friendship, Italy must be able to leverage its significant economic role in the region to help meet those demands for recognition, stability, and the assured future I referred to at the beginning in my remarks. Italy must consider the entire Balkans, and the Western Balkans especially, as an area of priority strategic interest to be forested both through bilateral relations and with an outlook towards their integration into international and multinational organizations of which Italy is a member. The Italian Republic has no hegemonic ambition, but we consider, it, we consider the Western Balkan a, an, area for, uh, uh, an area of a strategic importance for our country and for Europe. With uh, the Western Balkans, we have uh, cultural relations that have their roots in history. There, uh, there are uh, um, uh, hundreds of our uh, business in the region. We are the first or second largest partners of the countries in the region. 
political relations have been intenses, and uh, since uh, after Dayton, we have contributed significantly to stability action led by NATO. And uh, we have now an important uh, speech of the, uh, the, the chief of the Kosovo, uh, Kosovo uh, military forces. But uh, it's true, I, I agree, some consideration, uh, some remarks in this debate. It's true that uh, this present Italian presence and uh, uh, our strategy interest does not translate into sufficient visibility and uh, from the parliament we are, uh, we are so silly, we so silly, we solicit the government to make the Italian initiative in the, in the region. In the stability of the Balkans is a key strategic for our interest. It must, it must also strengthen the instrument that support of its economic projection to facilitate the qualitative leap in trade and direct investment. And at the same time, it must aim for greater integration between Italy's and Western Balkans, respective markets and economic system in the awareness of the need for a common destiny. There is no doubt the heart of the matter lies in the still unresolved diplomatic and political issues. In addition to the well known Berlin process to bring the six countries in the Western Balkans into the European uh, Union, including Italy. Italy can give uh, an important contribution and uh, also play a leading role in fostering fuller cooperation between the Central European Initiative and that the Adriatic and Union initiative. Both initiatives should be centered more decisively on the Western Balkans, with the goal of uh, buttressing the accession path for these countries of the European Union and NATO. In conclusion, we must be confident. The agreement that led to Greece's recognition for North Macedonia is a step towards the tents in the Balkans that the precondition for any initiative aiming to stabilize and integrate the Western Balkans. Of course, the current pandemic COVID-19 will unfortunately have severe economic, financial, and social consequences that are slowing down the integration process for the six Western Balkan countries. And in this mount, the European Union give many, many uh, uh, sustain to this country in, in, uh, in front of the difficulty caused by the COVID-19. This should not, however, distract us from, distract us from our goal. In the awareness that uh, there will not be fuel security in Europe until we achieve full integration in the Balkans. And uh, 100 years after the attempt at Sarajevo, it is time for the Balkans to be and feel like a full-fledged member of European, uh, European family. Thank you very much. Grazie mille, onorevole Fassino. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we are at the end of the day. I, I'm going to I'm closing the conference. I want to thank you all to be here, physically present today. And in fact, uh, I am surprised. I think, you know, it's just uh, to share the information with you. We had more than 150 persons at one time or another being physically present here, plus the same amount of people connected with us via uh, streaming. So, you know, it's a surprise sometimes, huh? I mean, <laughs> because uh, we dealt to have this event physically, we were not sure if, if it would uh, succeed. Uh, I think uh, it is the case. Uh, con concludo in italiano per ringraziare tutti per essere qui e spero che abbiate, come dire, immagazzinato questa immensa massa di informazioni sui Balcani <laughs> che abbiamo avuto oggi e che credo sia molto difficile da mettere insieme per chiunque. Buonasera a tutti. Thank you.